if you fund bursaries or you fund programs that invest in artists, composers, musicians, technicians, all of those, they contribute towards the rights business. Um, rights and royalties is only at the top of the value chain when the product's already developed. So if you're picking fruits from the top of the tree, from the top of the value chain, it's your responsibility to invest in the roots. The roots are education, the roots is development. In a society such as ours, or in a world such as ours, where what is deemed necessary, what is deemed beautiful, what is deemed glamorous, is often stuff that is not very wholesome, uh, but it's plentiful, it's everywhere, and it's just almost like there's a there's a, a flood of things that have no depth, but, uh, but have a lot of pull. The most important thing is finding people who want to support art, who want to become part of that, and who are prepared to put some money towards it, you know? I mean, the, the plan was to obviously further my studies. With that first money, I knew that I didn't have a horn, a really good horn, and I was using my teacher's horn. So I decided to buy my teacher's horn and use that. So that was the first trumpet that I ever owned. It's important in any industry to establish outliers. One of the challenges that one experiences with the arts and music is a lack of an understanding, especially with government, the lack of an understanding of the trajectory of the arts. We're quite clear about that. You invest at the lower levels, you follow these careers, and you touch them in different ways. And you touch them in the bigger way when they become composers, even after death. We've got original handwritten manuscripts by artists going back to the 1920s that's been preserved. Some remade a lot of things quite simpler, quite easy, more accessible, like its archives. You don't pay a lot of amount to like uh, actually perform it. One of the major challenges you have in a changing music scene is that live music is the bread and butter. So Norwegians approached us and said, what do we do about live music? Consistency is a live music development program um, that came about as part of a process of looking at what the live music scene looks like and kind of really trying to develop that part of, of, of music. Just to know that someone is listening someone is taking you seriously, someone is getting you started. It's like when someone is holding you by the hand and say, I'm gonna walk with you, you know? But getting involved in live, we needed something catalytic. A little bit of subsidy, a little bit of investment, plant it there and watch it grow. The nuts and bolts of it are that we receive a grant that allows us to underwrite our music program. We are a partnership where those with the resources and who want to make impact um, can create very life-affirming relationships with creative people who do the work. The project is important to me, on the one hand, generating revenue for artists, stability for venues, and for promoters. But it's most important to me because it's a cultural policy model, not in a theoretical sense. It builds a model that influences music, influences the arts, and takes culture to people. I mean, there is a comfort for me that, to know that, okay, it's supported by concert I say it means that definitely I'll be paid a, a certain type of amount and I know what to expect. So having the institutional framework to enable people like him to work is what actually makes us most optimistic about music, about jazz in, in this country. Our vision is much more to be uh, consistently the place where the best jazz live can be, can be uh, accessible. But you know, it's, it's great that as a venue, we do get uh, that, uh, that extra money. We've made a difference to many venues, many artists, many promoters. We can take that model to the state and say, you've not spent a cent on this. We've used international donor funds to help your arts, help us do it better. Where the live music scene is today wouldn't be quite 
where it is at the moment if it hadn't been for the support and initiatives of something like Concert SA. There was, there's just been a revolution, if you will, and Concert SA came at the right time as that. Promoters put on certain events for us as well, and they primarily work with the school circuit, which is really taking live music performances to schools. It's really beautiful, and when you see pictures at these schools where a jazz band is performing for young kids who are not necessarily into jazz, but just to see the, the joy in their faces, it's such a, it's a beautiful day. We call it our little joy drug, <laughs> you know, when you're having a bad day. A school gig is something you want to see. When I go to these concerts, I look at these kids and I see the light bulbs going off because you see how someone gets ignited by great live performance. It's great. It's actually, then I feel like a rock star. It's, it's a great gig. So getting into that circuit, obviously, it sustains our music, I think, because those, that's the audience of tomorrow. or arrange. I'm trying to, to make it work for myself. He's grown so much out of his being proactive, saying, I'm going to do this. I'm doing it, and I'm doing it, you know? Yeah, kind of like I'm entrepreneuring. Being an independent artist, not signed to any label, he's just doing it out of his pocket, out of the gigs that he does, out of, you know, grants from um, concerts as a Summer Foundation. So, you know, what can you say? You say the class is half empty, I say it's half full. We've had workshops around marketing for musicians and promoters and that kind of thing, knowing your rights as a musician. I think one of the biggest issues for musicians in South Africa is organisation. Um, not just depending on, on venues for, for work, but just making us work for ourselves. It's, it's really practical, necessary information for, people, for, for musicians and, and other practitioners to, to jack themselves up. Every song that gets registered... I mean, I would have learnt it uh, the, the very hard way. It would have taken me longer. I've always taken full advantage of that. Whenever something out and that I'm interested in it avails itself, then I obviously go for it. One of our biggest sort of activities is the Music Mobility Fund. Musicians apply um, to do a tour. It gives the musicians the power to organize their own tour, figure out how that's going to work for them. So pack your bags, we'll travel. That's what we're trying to encourage. And it's worked. There's been hundreds of artists that are now traveling. I applied to go to Zimbabwe, Mozambique, and Swaziland. So it was a pretty good deal. It was a bang for their buck. I got funding for less than 50,000. I got moving, and I got a lot done within 14 days. So to get something like this is very important, you know, so that uh, people can take their music out there. It's, it's the way that it's titled as well, mobility. It kind of gives you that grease for your wheels. Traveling is just, in itself, just such an important asset to, to artists. I think the, the Swaziland gig was a highlight out of all of them. I mean, that's where we got the most exposure and people saw us for the first time there. All the way from South Africa, Mzansi. I mean, that's how I grow as a musician. And that's how I grow, I mean, that's how I shape and that's how I mold my sound. I think Mandla is going to be one of those compositional voices, one of those performers whose trajectory can last a long time and shape and influence other players. I want to leave a legacy. Um, part of actually forming the Mandla Freedom Ensemble it would be doing that, working at it and actually having it as a, as a vehicle for, for other composers, for other musicians to tell their stories as well. So there's a number of these young cats who's starting to grow, who's starting to influence the scene. Mandla, at his younger age, is already starting to do that. And that's why we're supporting someone like him through the projects that we do. I want to be a greater, a better musician. I want to be a better person, better son, better father, better human being, not just a great musician. So my legacy uh, would be one of, of a person who, who's actually helped shape the, the South African story.
Lock nose giving Why should one invest in the arts? Why should one invest in music? It's how we experience things. It's how we learn. It's how we teach our kids. It's how we experience trauma during the struggle. And that's what music does. It's the soundtrack to our lives. If my dad was alive right now, what would I be saying to him? And this music, every time I play it, it's like me talking to him. Maybe talking to him in the spiritual realm. He was, was sent a puzzle bomb, a tape bomb. Yeah, you know, I mean, it messes up. I mean, as a four-year-old child, seeing your, your dad like lying there, I mean, blown to pieces. I mean, it's, it was very traumatic. So it, it's good to talk about it and actually engage with that kind of thing and actually understand the history of, of, of black pain, the history of black suffering. And that's how you get this music, jazz music. It's a triumph of the soul. So for me, my attraction to jazz music was that, was, was a triumph of that soul. He's one of the new voices that's talking to his past, his father's past, his family's past, his community's past, and reflecting as to where the youth are now. Why the trumpet? Why did you choose the trumpet? The trumpet actually chose me. 
the, the, the music school that I was attending was a bit under-resourced in terms of instruments. What instrument do you have? I'll just take anything, you know, for now. This is, oh, you know, there's a trumpet in my boot. Uh, go fetch it. The rest is history. My first real encounter with them uh, was in 2005, when I was doing my first year at Vits. And I got the sum of, I think, 9,000, which covered the tuition. Um, the philosophy behind, behind the foundation is that if you fund students, if you fund bursaries, or you fund programs that invest in artists, composers, musicians, technicians, all of those, they contribute towards the rights business. Um, rights and royalties is only at the top of the value chain when the product's already developed. So if you're picking fruits from the top of the tree, from the top of the value chain, it's your responsibility to invest in the roots. The roots are education, the roots is development. In a society such as ours, or in a world such as ours, where what is deemed necessary, what is deemed beautiful, what is deemed glamorous, is often stuff that is not very wholesome, uh, but it's plentiful, it's everywhere, and it's almost like there's a there's a, a, a flood of things that have no depth, but, uh, but have a lot of pull. The most important thing is finding people who want to support art, who want to become part of that, and who are prepared to put some money towards it, you know? I mean, the, the plan was to obviously further my studies. With that first money, I knew that I didn't have a horn, a really good horn, and I was using my teacher's horn. So I decided to buy my teacher's horn and use that. So that was the first trumpet that I ever owned. It's important in any industry to establish outliers. One of the challenges that one experiences with the arts and music is a lack of an understanding, especially with government, the lack of an understanding of the trajectory of the arts. We're quite clear about that. You invest at the lower levels, you follow these careers, and you touch them in different ways. And you touch them in the bigger way when they become composers, even after death. We've got original handwritten manuscripts by artists going back to the 1920s that's been preserved. Some remade a lot of things quite simpler, quite easy, more accessible, like its archives. You don't pay a lot of amount to like, uh, actually perform it. One of the major challenges you have in a changing music scene is that live music is the bread and butter. So Norwegians approached us and said, what do we do about live music? Consistence is a live music development program um, that came about as part of a process of looking at what the live music scene looks like and kind of really trying to develop that part of, of, of music. Just to know that someone is listening someone is taking you seriously, someone is getting you started. It's like when someone is holding you by the hand and say, I'm going to walk with you, you know? But getting involved in live, we needed something catalytic. A little bit of subsidy, a little bit of investment. Plant it there and watch it grow. The nuts and bolts of it are that we receive a grant that allows us to underwrite our music program. We are a partnership where those with the resources and who want to make impact um, can create very life-affirming relationships with creative people who do the work. The project is important to me, on the one hand, generating revenue for artists, stability for venues, and for promoters. But it's most important to me because it's a cultural policy model, not in a theoretical sense. It builds a model that influences music, influences the arts, and takes culture to people. I mean, there is a comfort for me that, to know that, okay, it's supported by concert. I say it means that definitely I'll be paid uh, a certain type of amount and I know what to expect. So having the institutional framework to enable people like him to work is what actually makes us most optimistic about music, about jazz in, in this country. Our vision is much more to be uh, consistently the place where the best jazz live can be, can be uh, accessible. 
Well, you know, it's, it's great that as a venue, we do get uh, that, uh, that extra money. We've made a difference to many venues, many artists, many promoters. We can take that model to the state and say, you've not spent a cent on this. We've used international donor funds to help your arts. Help us do it better. Where the live music scene is today wouldn't be quite where it is at the moment if it hadn't been for the support and initiatives of something like Concert SA. There was, there's just been a revolution, if you will, and Concert SA came at the right time as that. Promoters put on certain events for us as well, and they primarily work with the school circuit, which is really taking live music performances to schools. It's really beautiful, and when you see pictures at these schools where a jazz band is performing for young kids who are not necessarily into jazz, but just to see the, the joy in their faces. It's such a, it's a beautiful thing. We call it our little joy drug, <laughs> you know, when you're having a bad day. A school gig is something you want to see. When I go to these concerts, I look at these kids and I see the light bulbs going off. Because you see how someone gets ignited by great live performance. It's great. Actually, then I feel like a rock star. It's, it's a great gig. So getting into that circuit, obviously, it sustains our music. I think because those, that's the audience of tomorrow. You know that you're lighting the fires for a future audience, for a future musician, and perhaps for some of a future composer. I'm, for, I'm fortunate enough that I'm starting to live off my music, whether I compose or, or I arrange. I'm trying to, to make it work for myself. He's grown so much out of his being proactive, saying, I'm going to do this, I'm doing it, and I'm doing it, you know? Yeah, kind of like I'm entrepreneuring. Being an independent artist, not signed to any label, he's just doing it out of his pocket, out of the gigs that he does, out of, you know, grants from um, concerts as a Summer Foundation. So, you know, what can you say? You say the class is half empty, I say it's half full. We've had workshops around marketing for musicians and promoters and that kind of thing, knowing your rights as a musician. I think one of the biggest issues for musicians in South Africa is organization. Um, not just depending on, on venues for, for work, but just making us work for ourselves. It's, it's really practical, necessary information for, people, for, for musicians and, and other practitioners to, to jack themselves up. Every song that gets registered... I mean, I would have learned it uh, the, the very hard way. It would have taken me longer. I've always taken full advantage of that. Whenever something else and that I'm interested in it avails itself, then I obviously go for it. One of our biggest sort of activities is the Music Mobility Fund. Musicians apply um, to do a tour. It gives the musicians the power to organize their own tour, figure out how that's going to work for them. So pack your bags, we'll travel. That's what we're trying to encourage. And it's worked. There's been hundreds of artists that are now traveling. I applied to go to Zimbabwe, Mozambique, and Swaziland. So it was a pretty good deal. It was a bang for their buck. I got funding for less than 50,000. I got moving and I got a lot done within 14 days. So to get something like this is very important, you know, so that uh, people can take their music out there. It's, it's the way that is titled as well, mobility. It kind of gives you that grease for your wheels. Traveling is just, in itself, just such an important asset to, to artists. I think the, the Swaziland gig was a highlight out of all of them. I mean, that's where we got the most exposure and people saw us for the first time there. All the way from South Africa, Mzansi. I mean, that's how I... Cool. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the third concert essay workshop. It's so lekker that you all came out on this chilly Friday afternoon. And it's also so nice to see some familiar faces in the audience. Um, on my right is someone I've worked with for the last probably a bit more than a decade, Gwen Ansel. So Gwen Ansel is going to start the first session. I'm going to do some introductory remarks about concert essay and the work that it's done. Um, Gwen is going to talk to Digital Futures 2, and that's the research that we've done recently, published in December last year. 
Um, and then we're going to take some questions from you guys. That's if you have any questions, please write them down. If you've got a phone, you're most welcome to take pictures and do video and to post and to tag concerts, they say. But you're not welcome to play music during the sessions. As a Bliftochman. So silence would be nice. Only we play music, né? but not you guys. Um, then we're going to have uh, Violet Mahila. I don't know if Violet is here already or she's on the way. She's still looking for the grease for her wheels that someone spoke about in the video. So she'll be here and she'll be talking about, she's from Music in Africa. She'll be chatting about revenue streams for music creators in South Africa. And Music in Africa has, a, has been a partner of ours. <clears throat> to facilitate that session, we have Dr. Akona Nzuta. And I take it Dr. Akona is in the audience. Hello, Dr. Akona Nzuta. And you know this project, I think you worked on it about seven, eight or nine years ago, long time ago. And then, so that's Violet. And uh, respondents to the revenue streams, um, we thought it best that we have artists who respond to what these revenue streams are. So we have uh, um, uh, someone who also knows this project quite well and who knows the arts quite extensively, Nosisi Ngakana. Hello, Ngakane. Hello, Nosisi, who also runs AM Studios. And then we're having someone named Shekina. And I'm not sure if Shekina is here. Uh, James Shekina's not yet here. So she might be joining us, not here as yet, um, but she'll be popping in to respond to that research. We'll take a comfort break. Everybody needs to be comfortable once in a while. Comfort breaks, there's ladies' toilets is the first one on the right. Men have to walk a little bit further, and then also on the right. Um, um, at the reception, we've got uh, Nandi Nyani. Hello, Nandi from Samro. She's wearing a Samro T-shirt. That's how you know she's from Samro. Um, and then next to her is Nasima, who's um, not wearing a T-shirt, but she's also from Samro. I'm no longer from Samro, but I still work with Samro. Um, the last session, and that's going to be a very interesting session for anyone that's come here thinking they're going to be booked or to perform. Um, and they need to talk to the people on that panel. Um, there's this other weirdo guy named Andre Leroux. He'll be facilitating that session. And that's me, by the way. And then we'll have Nikki Sondlos. Has anyone heard of Nikki's in Newtown, the jazz club Nikki's? Well, if you haven't, then you're not in this business. Then there's Saul Shibambu. He'll be joining us shortly. He also is a promoter and runs venues. And then there's a guy named Steve Quenna Mokwena. How's it, Steve? He was on the video just now as well, so he's been around for a while. And then we'll close the workshop. There's coffee and tea out there. Note down the questions, and then let's get the show on the road, huh, Gwen? Sure. Uh, sorry, no, I need to do my presentation okay, quickly. Bye. You off to me, Gwen. Just, just, just quick. So oh, that was your presentation. <laughs> yes, it was that going to be that short. Okay, so. so <laughs> Uh, back is that way. So the red one goes back, Egfred. Okay. So firstly, before we start, can anyone pronounce that word that's uh, on, the, on the screen over there? Tisantak, that's cool. Please remember that, because I'd like you to be able to say it at the end of my presentation, which won't be that brief. Tisantak means thank you in Norwegian. Without the support of the Norwegian taxpayers, this project would never have happened. So I think it's only right to say thank you to the people that paid 80% of the revenue to, of the funding to make this happen. So quickly, let's do a quick practice. After me, one, two, three. Tusen tak. Okay, we got it done. So what did we try and do at Concerts SA over the last 10 years? We tried to keep the African live music sector alive. In Durban, I showed this picture. It's of an artist named Jaden Daniel. Fantastic music. That's him performing with a, 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 a poet from the Albert Latuli Museum, one of our venues. They're performing at the Durban Playhouse. They got a digital mobility fund. And then they recorded a wonderful piece of music. 
please go online and listen to that piece of music. And that's the legacy of Jaden Daniel, because that Digital Mobility Fund was the last recording, professional recording that he made before he passed. So you hear facts, figures, and data, but for me, it's also important to pay tribute to the artists and the personal stories. So forgive me if I touch on some of those personal stories. This is Shonisani Letole. Now, Shonisani wasn't an artist, but Shonisani was a very important person. He was a bridge builder between Norway and South Africa. But Shonisani died in hospital. Um, and you can read about it. I won't dwell on it too much. But when he passed, more than 25,000 people signed a petition. He wasn't just a bridge builder, he was an activist, and he was one of those people behind the concerts, one of those people that made things happen. Quite often we focus on the artists. For Concerts SA, the work that he did, building bridges between Norway and South Africa, was invaluable and will go on long after he's passed. And um, by the way, Welcome to our audience that's streaming. I understand that Shoni Sane's mom and dad is also streaming um, this uh, workshop. And I just wanted to say thank you, and thank you for everything your son did for us. This little picture over here, and I think Gwen would know why I'm putting that picture. In that picture is Don Laka with his band. In his band was a bassist, I think, named Pat Makoka from the Malo Poets. This was a performance at the Ditsong Museums. A week after this performance, he, Prapat was no longer. Gwen wrote a beautiful tribute, and that last professional recording remains. So as we talk facts, figures, and data, there's a lot of people in the background. There's a lot of venues in the background. There's a lot of stages. Those are some of the stages that were in Cape Town that are no longer. Um, the next slide is some of the stages that were in Johannesburg and are no longer. And I think some of you may remember some of those stages. There are many more. And you can see the central one is Nikki's, and Nikki will be joining us, and we'll be going to a gig there a little bit later. The baseline, the orbit, Liano, African Freedom Station, and Steve will tell you later, it's rising again like a phoenix, eh, Steve? This slide over here, the problem with it is that you can't see the numbers. You can't see the facts, figures, and data, but we will share this slide with you. In essence, what Concerts SA has done over the last, fifth, uh, last 10 years, supported over 15,000 work opportunities in over 1,000 venues, has, has touched on over nine, not over nine, there's only nine provinces, so it touched on all nine provinces, and 11 Sadiq countries. So it's done a lot. These are some of the things that Concerts SA does. I won't go through all of that. So there's brochures outside. For those of you who don't know what it does, have a look. We've engaged with research. We've engaged with digital mobility, physical mobility, schools programs. That's some of the research that we've done. Please download the research online. And the research for today, if you registered, the research is already in your inbox. So click and have a read through. What we've done initially was a mobility fund. And then there was this thing called COVID. You guys remember COVID? Some, oh, some, <laughs> some of us would like to forget it, wouldn't we? <laughs> um, but we first had a mobility fund. And because of COVID, it had to become a digital mobility fund. Uh, and yeah, digital mobility, what does it mean? I'll leave that question to Gwen. We also did another piece of research on Jerusalem, which I won't talk about too much. But that work in itself spoke about the ability of a work to travel, even when you can't travel. A big pivot for artists is to understand that your works can travel without you and generate an income. I'm not going to dwell on this slide. Firstly, because I'm not wearing my specs and I can't see everything. Secondly, because there were thousands and thousands of applications. Um, Rosie, can you see the top number at the back there? I can't see. It's 12,000, is it? Or what's it there? Oh, there's it. 2,237 applications were received. 
1,667 qualified, 355 were approved by a committee. So we did five digital mobility funds, 355 people became friends, and the rest were not so happy with us. But as we know, the ask is big. This, no, I'm not here to talk about cannabis. This is about, we call the school's program our joy drug. Um, and when Violet comes, she might chat about that too. Our joy drug, it's about, you know, when you see live music and the kids experiencing the music and how their eyes light up, that's our joy drug. If the others like the other joy drug, that's up to you. One of the biggest things we've done is lobbying and advocacy. Our research has informed our lobbying and advocacy, and we'll be issuing some stuff on some of the lobbying and some of the research that we've done over the years. Currently, we're involved in quite a few different activities. Lobbying and advocacy also means fundraising. So as the funds for Concerts SA comes to an end, the Norwegian funds, we're looking for more funds. But it's not just about money. If we can lobby local government to support the arts, to support music, we don't need that money, and it can, take, it can go further on its own. Um, but I'm not going to talk too much about the state. What remains after we've stopped our gigs and we've stopped the mobility fund already? There's a venues map and there's a gig guide. Please help us to build that venues map and gig guide so that we build the opportunities to perform in different spaces. Then, don't worry about all the text below. Some people are already asking me, so what can I do to help? If you're an artist, a venue owner, a promoter, and you want to help us to hunt, give me some arrows in our quiver that we can use. And with that, I mean recommendation letters. So, there's the brag slide again. And uh, some people have asked, uh, how much have the Norwegians actually contributed to this project? In the last 10 years, 55 million. I think that's quite a bit of bucks. Look at the Norwegian slice of that pie. 80% of the money to run this comes from the Norwegian embassy, from the Norwegian taxpayer and Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, the remainder comes from SAMRO, the Levido Foundation, and the National Arts Council. And I think that's why I started with that slide. Because I think the Norwegian people and the Norwegian embassy deserve a thank you. So on three. One, two, three. Thank you very much. And now let me hand over to Gwen. Nobody wants to sit here on a Friday afternoon and read lots of small print figures about lots of research. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to very swiftly go through the research that we did. I'll tell you a bit about the background. But if you go to the Concerts SA website, all the research that we've done over the years is accessible there. And it's far easier to read on your own phone or your own computer screen at some other time. But I'm going to start with a question, which is, apart from the fact that they're all musicians, what do you think Snoop Dogg, Sting, Paul McCartney, and Kate Bush have in common? Apart from the fact that they're all musicians. Any, any offers? And none of them is South African, of course. OK. In my context, what they all have in common is they've all in their various contexts and using their various channels, written to their various governments and regulatory authorities, complaining that streaming does not pay artists, does not treat artists well, and ne really needs to be brought under control. And they are not the only ones. I did a quick Google this morning, and I could have actually given you 30 names there, and I would still be leaving people off. So the first thing to say is that we need to engage with this digital platforming stuff on a very serious level. And the reason that we did a, a second piece of research on this, the reason that this thing is called Digital Futures 2, is that right at the start of COVID, we did 
Digital Futures One, which was a panic measure because Concerts SA was stuck with a live music program where it had already committed plans and suddenly live music was no longer possible. So at that stage, Concerts SA did a very small study, we called it a snapshot study, saying, what can we do with digital? Is it going to work for people who's already operating in the field? Can we just get a little sample of what's going on? And that information was incredibly useful for assisting Concerts SA to pivot. But even more, it left a huge number of questions unanswered. And one of those questions was, why is everybody whining about digital? What's going wrong here? Is it just because South Africans have not been long in the field? Is it just because maybe they don't really know what they're doing and they're not as sophisticated as their international peers? We just didn't know the answers to any of those questions. So as soon as it was feasible, we did Digital Futures 2, which we published last year where we actually sent out questionnaires to a much larger sample all across the country and actually asked them those questions, you know, have you been involved in digital, uh, in streaming for long? Is it paying you? How's it working for you? What business models are you using? And that's the research that I'm going to be talking about today. And basically from our 279 responses, more than half of them were people like a lot of the people in this room. They were sole contractors, so individual artists, or they were tiny, tiny businesses with maybe a couple of employees, so like an artist and a PA or something like that. Um, and very much like most of the people in this room, they therefore had to do everything for themselves. And just less than half of them had streamed in the year 2021 to 2022. 45% of them had actually done that live streaming. And I'll come on later to the fact that this is a minority, that most people hadn't been streaming, and we'd made some very interesting discoveries about the reasons for that. But for now, let's just say with that half sample, so we're talking like 140-odd people, um, we found that actually they were a very experienced minority. This answered one of the questions we had from Digital Futures 1. And that was that 77% of them had been involved in streaming before COVID. 40% um, of them, it's not on the slide, were actually using things like analytics to track their progress. So these were not people who didn't know what the heck they were doing and were just tail ending on a trend they'd heard about. These were experienced people and one of them said, we are experienced and savvy and it's still not paying for us. But we'll get on to that later. The fact remains that our sample were people who anything between four plus years and 12 months before COVID had already started streaming. When we asked them about business models, this is an impossible slide to read, so you really are going to have to look at the original. Um, their dominant model was not live streaming as such, which is why in many of the parts of the report we use the term streaming. They were doing delayed broadcasts. They were recording something and then putting it out. The dominant business model was free-to-air supported by somebody else, and the somebody else might be a concerts SA, it might be a local businessman who was a commercial sponsor of church music or something like that, could be anything. The second most dominant business model was hybrid ticketed events, where people did hold a very tiny socially distanced concert and then also put stuff out online. Every other kind of business model was below 20%. They're all listed up there, but I'm not going to go into them. Most people who were running ticketed events hoped that their ticket sales would cover their key costs. Whether that actually happened is something I'll come on to later. But the business model they were aiming at was that we will sell tickets and this will cover our main costs. But some other scary things came out of this bit of the survey. 14% of the artists who were involved in this took no pay. Zilch, zero. Giving away their intellectual property, giving enormous joy to the people who did take part in the streaming or the concert, paying nothing. 
an absolutely tiny percentage, so small that I can't even read it on my printout, received any kind of government support for what they were trying to do, but perhaps we shouldn't be surprised by that. Um, there was a huge dependence on donors or sponsors of various kinds. And this chimes very well with something that Violet may mention in her Music in Africa presentation, which is they found that artists were spending an enormous amount of time hustling for funds. Now, all well and good, you know, run your own business, be an entrepreneur, all of that. But while you are hustling for funds, you can't be creating music. So there's a huge opportunity cost involved in that. And yet, this was the only way that for many, many people, the streaming model could work, was that they had to find a sponsor of some kind. And some sponsors, like Concerts SA, have a, a fairly regimented procedure. You fill in forms, you go, you get shortlist, long-listed, you get shortlisted, you go before a panel. But so other people were going round local businesses with a hat, which is even more time-consuming and possibly very, very demoralizing. We asked our respondents, who are your key partners? 48% of them said the platforms. And the thing I would say here is that it's not necessarily my definition of a partner. Because, um, yes, you need the platforms in order to put your music out there, but they're not necessarily your friends. And the best example of that I ever saw, this was an explanation from the New York Times. If Drake gets 5% of all global sales of music streamed on that platform, then he gets 5% out of the streaming pot including money from people who've never listened to a Drake track in their life and wouldn't want to. But that's how the algorithm works that divides up the money. And when you add to that the fact that platform-curated playlists push people towards these big-name artists because they pay better for the platforms, then you realize that your platform may be an essential partner for you, but really, honestly, not necessarily your friend. Then we ask people the crunch question. What do you earn from live streaming? 62% of them, or 63% if you add in the little bits that we haven't put on this slide, said that their experience of earnings was poor or very poor. A grand total of 17% said their earnings were good or very good. But what this adds up to is that at best, income from streaming has to be supplementary to some other activity, and of course, Post-COVID, we would hope that that is live music again. But so for some people, streaming is a supplement to not very much because other research that we've been doing recently suggests that there's been a fairly slow recovery, particularly in some regions of this country, back to live music again. In other places, it's picked up nicely, but not everywhere. But at worst, streaming is a cost. And some of our respondents mentioned this. Firstly, because you have to pay a platform fee, and your platform fee is in dollars, and what you get back is in point naught, 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 naught of a cent. And also, again, the, um, the hustle of organizing, of having content, of having it at the time when you need it, and all of that, which for people who were relatively new was more of a hustle. For people who've been doing it for a while, slightly less of a hustle, but it's still a hustle. So in some ways, streaming had a cost and didn't earn much of an income. And that really was one of the big problems. It was true in the first survey that we did in this one. It was still true. People are not earning from streaming. And now we know, and I'll get on to this, that that's not just true in South Africa. We saw a slight improvement in who owns the master recording. That was up from this study. Um, about 54% of artists had sole ownership of the master that they made to stream with. And that's a positive development because it means that your possibility of leveraging other kinds of earnings off that are there. But one of the things we found that isn't represented on a slide is that lots of people had hopes that they could leverage that master, but very few people had actually yet either the know-how or the time to get round to actually doing it. So this is much more like an insurance policy for the future rather than now. When we asked people what they saw as the benefits of streaming, 22% said exposure, 
33% said better audience, which in my book is exposure again. Um, that's 55% of people who see the only benefit as exposure. And those of you who are in the biz know how you feel when you go to a concert organizer and say, what's in it for me? And he says, but think of the exposure you'll get. So you know what exposure <laughs> means. What isn't on a slide here, but I think though is very important, is we ask people, why are you doing this? And the thing that came across most strongly was a huge sense of social and community mission. Um, we do it to provide hope, people were saying. They remember, this was still the COVID period. Or we do it to tell our ghetto stories, somebody said. There was a huge sense that even if they weren't making money, there were stories that needed to be told and messages that needed to be got out and that that was why they were streaming, even though they knew very realistically they weren't going to make much money out of it. They saw the risks as... Piracy, uncertainty, low audience numbers, and they saw that those risks were carried predominantly by the artists themselves and by their partners. So places like venues were also carrying those risks. So essentially, you're getting very few benefits, not much money, and you are carrying all the risks. But as Andre has said, digital mobility means that your music does get out there. Your music can travel even if you can't. And although I was very cynical about exposure a few minutes ago, there's a sense in which you can also hook up with artists in other countries because they hear your music and it sounds nice. Or you can make a dance video like an Ang Angolan dance group did somewhat before uh, we did in this country with uh, Jerusalem. And, you know, there are benefits. I'm not saying there aren't benefits. But for people who were jumping into this in the panic situation of COVID, they were having a really negative experience. But what about the people who weren't live streaming? The 55%, the majority, they didn't have resources, they didn't have equipment. And if you add this to other open responses, because we asked some open questions where people could write stuff, not just tick a box, 70% of the people who replied to us overall said that problems with South Africa's digital divide, the cost of being online, the speed, bandwidth, connectivity, all of those things, load shedding. And never mind load shedding, what about the people who don't have power at all anyway? Which is a great deal. And I was, you know, I was quite shocked. I was looking at the city power notices today and I realized that while we're all celebrating that we're only on stage three in the evenings, the people who are suffering under what's called load reduction may not have power from four o'clock until nine o'clock this evening. And that may well be another of the reasons why we're so well off at the moment. So let's not forget that not everybody can be part of the digital economy if they don't even have power. And all our favorite quote on this because it's quite a heartbreaking one and also because it draws our attention to the fact that not all music audiences are young and not all music audiences are involved in pop genres is someone who responded to us, my audience is very poor because some of my fans don't understand the streaming technology and some of them don't have phones that allow them to stream my music. A huge part of South Africa's music industry is under the white English-speaking commercial radar. And we've got to remember that. Our music industry does not live on the stuff that Kaya FM plays. Our music industry is much bigger than that. But then we did some desk research, and this is where it gets really interesting. This is a global problem. It's not just our problem. Artists' earnings are universally poor from streaming, unless you are Taylor Swift. Artists' earnings are poor, and even Taylor Swift is aware that she's especially privileged because she's done a lot of campaigning on this. Um, a few big international companies, we used to call them the fangs when Facebook was Facebook and not Meta, but a few big international companies actually control the value chain. And the UN WIPO, the World International Property Organization, says those platforms are destroying music, and there's been no trickle down. Nevertheless, the platforms are getting richer, and now they're back in bed with the record labels. The record labels are getting richer again. <coughs> Who's not getting richer? The artists. 
We're the worst off because of the digital divide, but we're also the worst off, and this was mentioned by a huge number of our respondents, by policymakers who A, did not understand the arts and culture sec sector, and B, didn't listen when people tried to tell them. And we had some really heartbreaking quotes about, you know, I try and talk to my local DAC and they, they, they treat me with disrespect was what it boiled down to. We had some quite heartbreaking stories of that. And the whole issue of streaming and the revenue potential of it, and the fact that the digital platforms don't just get rich on the money you pay for a stream. They're marketing your data all over the place, and that's one of their biggest sources of income. And our new proposed copyright laws don't really look at this. They're not negative about it. They just simply don't look at it. Because we have, I think, a lot of people in Parliament who are of a generation who don't really understand it. So I'm going to skip over what's changed since 2020, since most of you haven't read the 2020 report, but I'm going to talk about what needs to be done. Policymakers need to listen, and they need to understand the sector better than they do. We need to do something about the digital divide. The platforms need to be encouraged to make more equitable payments to artists, although one of my favorite writers on this, a guy called Corey Doctorow, actually points out that if your kid is being bullied at school by somebody who takes their lunch money, if you give your kid more lunch money, the bully's just going to take more of it. So bigger payments without some other regulation might not be the best solution on their own. Um, SoundCloud has brought in fairly recently some user-centric royalty plans where you actually pay, the royalties go to the artists you stream and not anyone else. But the big artists don't really like this and therefore they're likely to desert the platforms and therefore that one isn't going to fly. Um, Spotify has a tip jar, which is the most insulting and patronizing thing I can think of. Um, it's a global challenge, it needs global solutions. But locally, we need um, more digitally related training and information put around. Not just the stuff I'm saying today, there's a lot of good information out there. And perhaps our DACs and our national DSAC could actually be part of getting this information out, making training, making um, awareness accessible. And the CMOs, the organizations like SAMRO, actually need to communicate better. This was one of the things that had not changed between our first survey and our second survey, that people needed information about how this royalty stuff worked from the CMOs, and the communication was poor. Some people were very paranoid and felt that the, the evil went further than that. But an awful lot of people said, just, these guys don't talk to us. We need them to talk to us in language that we can understand. Um, my personal feeling on all of this is that this is a global problem and it needs global solutions. And we shouldn't just accept the power and position of the digital platforms. Let's not be technological determinists. We can decide how this stuff is used. It can have enormous benefits. I think Jerusalem has showed us that in some ways. But only if we say somebody we don't know, somewhere we don't know is making all these decisions and we have no hand in it. We have to start demanding a hand in it and that means we have to start educating our government on what has to happen. And as artists, my clicker is not working. Yes, here it is. This is what somebody said. As artists, we need to be flexible, adaptable, and multi-skilled because we are on our own. And that's both a hopeful and a not hopeful note to end on. But it's where I'm going to stop, and I hope lots of you have discussion points to add to this. Thanks, Gwen. Um, I take it you guys, the mic's on. You can hear? A round of applause for Gwen. It's a 60-odd page report that Gwen did in way less than 60 minutes. I think it needs a better round of applause than that. And I, um, most of you, you received um, the Revenue Streams report. You received Digital Futures. The, we call it the people's version. We like to call our smaller version the people's version because we are aware that not everybody wants to read the 60-odd page report. But please do have a good read. Come back with questions. We'll give you some chance to have questions now. Oh, and share with your friends. 
themselves. Because oh, yes. not everybody's here. Tell people about this stuff. And if you want us to watch, actually you can WhatsApp it yourself. Download it, WhatsApp it to people out there. They can use it. Jits Finner in Cape Town. He sent it to everyone that he knew because there are certain aspects of the report that's really easy and user-friendly to use, to read. Gwen, when I was in Cape Town, there was a promoter, one of our promoters, um, Gavin Minter, and he's quite a, a well-known promoter, does quite a bit, and he was saying the tip jar is a wonderful thing, and you're saying it's not. I'm saying the principle is not. The tip jar will work for some people, and nobody's arguing about that. But um, one of the reports I read compared it to forcing musicians to be buskers. You're actually asking them to. You know, they've already done that by using their brains and their hands and their musicality to give you music. Why should you have to tip them for that? They should receive payment for their intellectual property. Okay, I'm not going to go further on that one. Yeah. <laughs> and it comes. The other thing that you said during the research, you weren't speaking too positively about the platforms. Now, should we not qualify platforms? Because during COVID, there were platforms that were here, like the militias and some of those that did assist. Is that not a generalization to paint I them? I specifically talked about the what used to be the fangs, but are now the mangs, which doesn't sound quite so good. <laughs> Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, um, Google. Spotify, those are the people who have the main power. I think there may be a future in developing South African music platforms, local music platforms. I know um, it's called Mdundo in Kenya, claims to pay its artists far better than any of the international platforms do. Um, not better in absolute terms, because currencies are different, but actually gives them a fairer share. And I think that could well be a way to go. That requires cooperation from policymakers at very high levels in any country where it's going to happen. But I was specifically talking about the major international platforms, Andre. I don't yeah. want to attack local platforms, which basically were lifesavers for yeah. people during the COVID period. Okay, I take it we're not talking to the fangs of the mangs in the audience today. Um, how many of you are you a fang? Somebody raised their hand. We're going to get to some questions, but just before the questions, how many artists in the audience? Please raise your hands higher, because I don't have my glasses on. How many of you streamed or have streamed music? Streamed your music. How many of you made money from streaming your music? Okay, I think the research finally yes. just spoke. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you, James, for prodding me on that question. That answers that. Okay, let's get to the questions. Um, any questions from the audience? I think, did you have your hand up? We've got, let me take, if it's one or two, um, we've got one over there. Um, please introduce yourself, and then we can pose some questions. Go for it. Any other questions? Is that you, Jotam? Okay, one, two. Ah, a CMO, that's cool. So please introduce yourself. We'll just take two for now. Think about your questions and write them down. Hello. Can you Hi. hear me? Yes, yes. My name is Alani Kiza. I'm a singer-songwriter, and I've been doing for music for over 20 years. But I've only started doing it very professionally for the, for the past nine years, where I've gone to a producer and what, whatnot. So I'm probably in the pool where I'm a bit more privileged than most people, where I've got a US sponsor who sends me to studio, and she pays for a lot of things that I have to get involved in with music. So this is my question. If I am in the minority of actually getting out there and having paid for things, why does South Africa, uh, the platforms in South Africa, not allow us to be able to have the streaming, the fangs and the mangs and whatnot uh, under a South African umbrella? Because I've had music out there for many years. I've streamed, I've done whatever I can. Um, I've put music via CD Baby on the platforms to all streaming platforms, and in three years I've made $8. $0.001 per stream is a ridiculous slap in the face. So for me, as a South African person making music, I feel as South Africans we should have our own platforms where we can make music differently from the rest of the world. Because our, I think with our struggle and what you've mentioned, load shedding, X, Y, Z, whatever else, um, I think that's a major, major stumbling block for all musicians in South Africa. 
I'm privileged. I stay in a, in a house where I hardly have load shedding. I can't imagine what the rest of the musicians in South Africa, South Africa do that have worse uh, cases than I have. Thanks, Alana. I think if you can bring the mic to the front. Jotam, you wanted to say something? And by the way, Alana was one of the people that raised their hands who said they made money from live streaming, and now she's at the caveat is $8. So. That's from, that's from the streams over the years. Okay, cool. Ah, thank you for the caveat. Okay, um, uh, the microphone to Jot. Have you got the mic, John? Jot? Can you please pass the... Raise your hand, please. Keep your hand up in the air. Wave it like you just don't care. Okay, go. There we go. <laughs> Yeah, we'll go off to Jotam, we'll go to Nosisi, and then we'll, we'll, we'll come back to you, Gwen. Is that okay? We do three? Sure. Okay, Jotam. Okay, uh, thanks, Andre. Uh, for me, it's just... You must introduce just... yourself. Don't depend on me. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> my name is Jotam, and I work for Kapaso. Um, my question is, um, actually, I'm addressing it to you, uh, ma'am. Sorry, you were in the, uh, introduced when I was not yet here. So, my question is, uh, in your... Um, research. Uh, did you find anything that was to do with during uh, when somebody is uh, because there are issues that we have uh, identified where somebody is um, live streaming uh, the music and they are performing and sometimes they get to perform the music that they did with other people mm -hmm. or the music that is not really theirs but they're just performing it. Have there been any issues of that music taken down and um, Perhaps it's an issue of education that you were talking about to say, uh, do our artists know what to do before they perform music that doesn't necessarily belong to them? Thank you. Thanks, Jotam. On the takedown, now for... Please introduce yourself, Nosisi. Uh, hello, my name is Nosisi. Uh, I work at, for Amped Studios. Um, so for me, it's more of a comment than anything in that as an artist, so I'm a kind of a professional in this space, but I'm also a musician. Um, and there's, I think, one aspect of it which I completely agree with is that there is a privileged uh, minority that has got access to certain information, and, and a big component about what happened with COVID was that there wasn't access to information. So if you were just an artist that was relying on performances, then you kind of found yourself in a very screwed space. Um, but, you know, um, I just wanted to highlight Bandcamp um, as a platform that was really amazing during... Um, COVID, um, and I think just kind of going forward, that Bandcamp has probably got some of the most amazing deals um, in the sense that they give artists 50% of the revenue streams. Um, if you get people listening to more than a thousand, like if you're more than a thousand people listen to your music, then you qualify for vinyls. Um, there's a streaming platform mm -hmm. built into the program itself. So you accessing the Bandcamp audience as well. And a big limitation with a lot of these um, kind of DSPs, your Spotify's, your YouTubes, et cetera, is that if you didn't have an audience before COVID, then it's very difficult for you to say, I'm going to do a live stream and hope that 10,000 people come and watch my show when I don't have 10,000 subscribers on my YouTube page. So there was a lot of, you know, there's, there was a lot of pre-preparation that if you were not in the right space at that time, it would have been very difficult for you to make music. But if you were an artist who already had a strong online following and you had a good, good strong line um, online strategy, then you'd probably make a lot, like you probably made some decent money from your streams. And that's, that's yeah, that's it. Thanks, Nasisi. We're going to come to Gwen. Okay, um, I'm going to go kind of backwards. And I did say, Nasisi, not all platforms are evil. And Bandcamp's the one I've still got time for, although about six months ago it was taken over by new ownership. And there is some question about whether its artist-friendly policies are going to sustain in the very long term. But certainly right now, I mean, given that one of my other hats is as a reviewer, if you want me to review your music and it's on Bandcamp, I will buy it. If it's on Spotify, please send me sound files because I'm not giving those people my money. But yes, Bandcamp very likely gives you the best deals. Um, YouTube is probably the most problematic because it offers enormous access to intellectual property with no payment to anybody, and yet it's making huge amounts of money off the user data that it amasses in that way. Um, if anybody wants to know how that system works, although it's quite an American-oriented book, please read Cory Doctorow's book, Choke Point Capitalism, 
and which I, you can access online because he doesn't believe in digital rights management, so somewhere online you'll find one for free. But it explains how that system works, whereby the platform, the big platforms, the evil platforms, not the non-evil ones, actually have a chokehold both on the creators of intellectual property and the consumers of it. They sit in the middle, and that gives them enormous power to manipulate. So, Masisi, I agree with you about that. Um, Elana, um, why doesn't South Africa do X is not a question I would be able to answer, but it's a question I would definitely echo. I think this issue of what could we do locally that would make this system work better is an extremely important one, and I wish somebody was asking it of the, um, the Parliamentary Committee and DSAC, because I do think it's incredibly important. But why doesn't South Africa, like lots of things that our Department of Arts and Culture does, don't ask me, I don't understand it either. <laughs> Um, Jotun, your question is a good one, although it actually, it crosses across some questions that we didn't ask in our research. But what I can tell you is that the vast amount of international research on this says that there are particularly major problems. Firstly, for composers, and this goes to your question about covers. Composers seem to be especially disadvantaged by this system. And secondly, for support artists as opposed to band leaders, because of course the music is under the leader's name very often, and that there's a very knotty set of problems there, which mean that streaming tends to work worse for those categories. Beyond that, we didn't inquire about that in our research, so I'm afraid I can't give you a definitive answer. But what I can say is the huge appeal when we said what, could, what more could be done and people said we need more education, we need more information, I think that does tell us that people need to know the right way to do this. Thanks, Gwen. Is there, if there's, is there any other burning questions? Um, we've got one hand over there. Um, as we take the microphone to that hand over there, Jotam, if you'd like to, from the CMO perspective, commission us for Digital Futures 3 and we can ask more questions, please have a chat to me later. <laughs> Wicked. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Nell Summer X. I'm a singer songwriter. And, um, well, it's not really a question, but it's something that I thought maybe I should throw out there because I was reading this other um, research proposal about, like, you know, how the revenue or the amount of money that's made for the US um, music industry from South Africa alone, you know, there is, they're actually making streaming more American music on our radio platforms. They're streaming more time is spent playing other people in other countries' music, and therefore they pay royalties to the Americans rather than here in South Africa, because even the money that's made here in South Africa doesn't necessarily go to artists. Like, there's quite a bit of research about that, but there's maybe something, I don't know, maybe that could be a contributing factor to why a lot of South African artists, we don't necessarily be getting like a piece of the cake like that, just like the other international embassies are doing. I don't know, but they just want to say come back straight on that one. Yeah. Okay, um, that's a very good point. The, the whole question of local, of local airplay, I think is a really important one. Again, slightly tangential to what we were surveying, but um, bear in mind that local airplay is not just determined by the policies of broadcasters, but also by the preferences of advertisers who love international music because they think it gets their products to a higher spending audience. And there has been research in the radio and commercial radio sphere that actually covers that. Where we are massively disadvantaged, and I mentioned this in passing, is in the playlists that outfits like Spotify create because they deliberately steer people towards clicking on the music that they want to make money off. Uh, but I think there is something in terms of local music, local airplay, we've had local platforms raised. I think the whole issue of the localization of our music industry, which does not mean 99% local music, I'm sorry, because music is a world, but it does mean a lot more local music than we are currently hearing. 
Um, there was originally um, there was originally a proposal before Claudi Motswenang actually changed the game slightly. There was a proposal for 60 or 70 percent local and 30 or 40 percent international. That would have worked very well, quite honestly. But unfortunately, that whole SABC experience has now made that a debate that people don't want to get into again. I think we should revisit it. I think local airplay quotas are important. I don't think 99% is the way to go, but I do think they are important. And I would love to see the Department of Sport, Arts and Culture considering all aspects of the localization of our music industry, listening to people who know what they're talking about, like artists, and coming up with some proposals. I really do think that's important, and thank you for raising it. Good input. Um, localization of music, totally agree. Quotas, how they get implemented. You can't just make a statement. No. You need to be able to implement something real. Because what that last local content debacle caused was the damaging of the business models. And in turn, artists' music were paying, played more, but artists got paid less. So you, it has to be not just a statement of intent, but a policy engagement that's structured and rolled out in a way so you don't damage the platforms that can get revenue to the artists. But I'm not going to say anything about the Schlaudi moment we had. Well, except um, I think the problem is it shut down that debate, and that debate should not have been shut down. It yes, was an important one. Totally agreed. Uh, and totally agreed about the pieces of cake. Um, with Concert's essay, we, we don't have a role in that, but we did bring donuts and scones. So, um, <laughs> very important point. Um, we need to move to the next panel, but before I do, Jot, I need to ask your permission if I can put you on the spot with a question. Seeing you represent CMOs, and I'm so glad you came. If you say no, it's cool. I'll speak to you later. Oh, okay. Fine. I can fix it. Okay. I mean, like, you know, the, the, one of the gaps in terms of our research as well is really the... Gwen talks about the platforms, but you actually have the coalface. All the CMOs directly engage with these platforms. How has your engagement been with these platforms? And I'm not going to ask you which ones are the best and which are the worst. But give us a sense from a collective management organization. For those of you that don't know, those are the Capasos and the Samros and the, the other entities. How has your engagement been with these platforms and the streaming services? Okay, so um, in terms of the engagement, it's been, um, ob obviously, we are also worried about uh, the amount of money that the artists and the composers eventually get. But as, as a CMO, we represent uh, publishers and music composers and authors. Uh, we represent mostly music composers, publishers, and I've just been asked to stand up. <laughs> okay, so we represent music publishers, composers, and um, and authors. So the part that I will talk about is it, as it relates to music composition and writing. So our relationship has been very good and I feel it is something that has allowed um, the streaming services to launch in the country. Yes, I get your point. It's unfortunate that we don't have local streaming services who really understand our music and who really understand our issues and all that. But the big um, uh, streaming services, what they want to do when they get into a country, they want to get the rights. And uh, they have been more than willing to be able to get those rights uh, in order for them to be able to launch. And the relationship has been very good. The one issue that is of major concern is uh, obviously the relationship between us as CMOs and uh, musicians and music composers and all that. Because for a CMO to be able to really show you value as a musician, either as a composer um, and, and, or even as a publisher, we need to have the data. It's different from the old way of licensing that we used to do, where we can just go to the SABC or multi choice get a license, and then we get paid, and then when we get paid, we get the report, and then we come to you and say, we've got all this money that we've received. These are the people whose music have been used, and if part of this music is yours, please come and uh, notify us so that we can be able to pay you with the splits and all that. With digital, it's completely different. We need to have the data first because there are a lot of people that are claiming uh, here because unlike 
SABC, you cannot expect a PRS to come from the UK and come and license SABC. That will never happen. But if it is Apple, Apple is based in Ireland. PRS is in the UK. So they will license there for the exploitation that is happening here. So Apple cannot just pay us. They need to know what is it that we control. And for us to know what is it that we control, we need your data, we need your information, and the splits for us to then say, here is what we do control, and these are the people that we represent. Then they pay us. So the biggest problem that we currently have as a CMO is that we don't have enough data. We actually publish reports, but obviously we can only send it to our members because if you are not a member, we don't have your details and we can't send you any information. So what we do is when we process, we then identify what is not paid but which has been streamed and then we send it to, um, to the members and then the members can come back and say, this is what we control. But otherwise, that is uh, the issue and our relationship is very good, but the major issue is the data issue. Thanks, Jatam. And thank you for joining the panel informally. Um, Gwen, any last word of wisdom or research wisdom that you would like to leave with the people in the audience? I would just say read the reports in full. I've, I've hardly done them justice, and there was such huge richness, particularly in the remarks, the open remarks that people made to us. You could just really hear musicians' voices talking. So I would say please read the reports, that's all. Please read them. If you're going to be doing streaming, read the reports. They are lot, there's a lot to learn. Even if you're not. Even if you're not. Okay, cool. Okay, our next panel is uh, uh, Conan Zuta. You'll be facilitating. The presenter is Violet, who's hiding behind the pillar over there, I think. Hi, Vi. Okay, there's Violet. Violet was the project manager of Concerts Essay, by the way, and has done a lot of work with us. So, Violet, if you could join us. Thank you, Gwen. Last round of applause for Gwen. Um, thanks. So, Violet, if you could join us, Akona and Nosisi and Gakane. Sorry? Yeah, right now, if you could pop into the front. And then, I, is Shakina here as yet? Hi, Shakina, where are you? There's it. Oh, okay, in the pink. Cool. Okay, I think you're also going to come pop on stage. Come through, and I will have a seat.
my mom is here. <laughs> this is so strange. <laughs> <laughs> Hi everyone, thanks for joining us um, for this conversation. Um, the last discussion really, oh gosh, so many important points there, um, which is stuff that is sad because so much has changed and yet so little has changed. You know, I mean, I, was, I came in the room and I saw Rosie Cutts. Um, and when I was a performer in 2001, you know, we had a gig, um, some, I can't remember whether it was, I think it was somewhere in Soweto, and Rosie Cutts was working for um, what used to be called South African Music Week, you know, and we were funded, um, our tiny little band, um, as one of the people who would showcase South African, you know, music for South African Music Week back then. And it seems such a long time ago now, you know, that's 22 years ago, is it? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you know, it's crazy. And yet we're still talking about um, how much South African music should be on South African radio. Mm -hmm. And I'm so glad you raised that point about the fact that, it actually confirmed somebody else who said something to me about how um, streaming is just really as bad as radio. You know, so then that brings us to the question of this very panel. Um, how do South African music practitioners actually live? How do they make money? How do they make revenue? Forget profit, just having money generated coming in, right? Um, how do we do this? So um, for this session, we'll be discussing the viability of different revenue systems for, or streams for South African musicians. Um, we'll have a presentation um, of a report called Revenue Streams for African Musicians. Uh, and they'll be presented by Music in Africa, the Music in Fo um, Africa Foundation, which is the organization that actually conducted the research. After that, we'll have some feedback from our uh, respondents um, who are on the front lines of working in South African music industry practice. Um, we'll then open the discussion to everyone else. And um, while you're listening to the report, uh, thinking about what the, re the, the findings are, uh, please formulate some questions you know, uh, for uh, the person who's gonna do them. But first of all, before we, we do that, let me introduce myself. Um, so I'm Akonan Zuta. And I am based at the Chief Albert Lutuli Research Chair at UNISA. Um, and I'll tell you why I'm mentioning that. Um, so I do research on the relationships between um, South African music, South African public policy, and South Afri the conditions of South African music practitioners. That's what I do. So this is all like something I've been involved in personally, but also it's within my ambit of research. Um, and then our research presenter is somebody I'm friends with on Facebook, <laughs> Violet Maila. She is a visual communications specialist. She's an arts activist, and she's currently the project manager for Music in Africa Foundation here in Johannesburg. And then our first respondent is Nosi Singakane, she is the AMPD or AMPT Studios Operations Manager. But apart from this, she is, uh, apart from you know, her arts management role, which it seems she's been involved in many times in, 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 in many different organizations, she's also a music creator and she's an arts community um, activist or worker. Um, and I recently found out it just so happens that she is the great-granddaughter of Chief Albert Lutuli himself. So, what a coincidence. Um, but it's interesting because, um, I'm gonna plug in my work here a little bit. Historical documents have actually showed us that apart from his social justice activities, and uh, political activities generally, Chief Albert Lutuli was actually involved in culture 
as a choir conductor, but he was particularly, no pressure here, an arts advocate, right? So this is serendipitous in, in so many ways. Uh, and so I appreciate your presence on the panel. Um, and then our third uh, speaker, who's our respondent um, is someone I guess I really shouldn't be introducing at all because she's so prominent right now as um, a performing artist. Shekina or Shekina? Shekina. Shekina, yeah. okay. So um, Shekina has become influential in so many ways, not just through her art, but because of the platforms she's given others, right? Uh, she is a recorded popular music vocalist, but she's also a songwriter. And apart from that, she's won a slew of awards um, on the African continent. Um, and recently, or at least two, three years ago, you ran the project Rose Fest, right? Which celebrates and uplifts um, female talent, South African music female talent. Right? And it's not necessarily performers, but uh, women who do different things in various capacities in the music industry. So welcome, all of you. Um, importantly, though, Violet, you have news. I do. You do. <laughs> so please tell us what your uh, project is, what the research is about, what the research is, what its aims are, but particularly what your findings were because it's, it's very um, interesting that there are more organizations like this doing this kind of work. Sure. I think I may just do that. The best way for me to do that is to run through my presentation, which I will try my level best to right. summarize. There's a lot of information in there. There's a lot of data in there as well. Um, so please, just to let everyone know that it is available in this lovely little format, but it also lives again on our... Um, on our platform at the, on the Music in Africa Foundation portal for anyone to access and go through in quite a lot of detail. Uh, but just to quickly contextualize who we are and why we do what we do, I represent the Music in Africa Foundation. We exist to service the African music sector in various ways. We try and find smart ways to create projects, design ideas that help build capacity for African musicians at large, um, create networking opportunities, and also just to, to, yeah, to really expose artists to a bigger market. Uh, we do this in various ways, uh, but our key flagship sort of activity, which I think would be of good interest to you outside of our research, is we run an annual music trade show, which is probably one of the biggest on the continent. It's called Access, and we will be in Tanzania this year. So just kind of go visit our website and find details on that. I think it is quite interesting. It is an element of um, panels and loss of networking, but also showcasing opportunities for musicians that are exposed to quite a number of um, record labels, festival promoters on a global scale. So there's quite a lot of access within Access, if I could do the penny thing. Um, so this particular research, we felt a need to, I think, f to realize and, and recognize the need for data within the music industry and how important it is to validate what we do based on some data. And it was important to then see what, you know, what matters to artists most from what a lot of what we've done outside of just, you know, learning and having capacity is really having tools and understanding how you best um, start to monetize your craft and what you do so well. So we, it, we thought it would be important to, put, to, to create some data and give a, a tangible something that could become a good reference for um, African musicians. Um, so how we started this is we got some funding um, from UNESCO, from the National Arts Council here at home, and we were able to then get a room, into a room, a group of experts around um, you know, what are, how do we categorize these revenue streams and how do we then, you know, because, because the list is long, it's very long, how do we categorize these and start talking to people? And we figured it would be really important to do a, some research. So we, during COVID, which was kind of, you know, that sort of strange timing um, based on our timelines, this research happened under COVID. And so we looked at, a, we created an online platform uh, where a questionnaire, so to speak, where artists, where music creators, and I think the, 
the word music creator is really important because it doesn't it doesn't exclude other practitioners um it does or, or, or other uh, other creators so it doesn't it's not specifically only to performing artists for example it speaks to composers um, and and a plethora of others um and so we had a sample of 3,000 um, music creators across all nine provinces um, in South Africa, who through a network of um, researchers, about 15 odd researchers, were able to really have a conversation, plug it into our platform, and really had a series of questions that helped us to start to figure out what existing revenues are there. So the sample that we used was based on about 3,000 packs. And the findings of this research is based on that, you know, very small, but technically quite a good representation because the res it was really important for us to kind of not have research that would be directed or focused and seem to only come from an urban environment. And you'll see how that, that those find the findings from the research starts to speak to a little bit of that. So we really had people that, you know, we, we had researchers re um, speaking to people on Zoom, we were having WhatsApp interviews, we were having people do this research through through our online platform. So that's that was the base of how we got to where we were. And the methodology, like I said, we looked at um, how we then start to try and um, categorize these um, create taxonomies to kind of categorize these revenue streams. And the sort of five key categories you'll see is includes um, live, music revenue, live music performance revenue, services revenue, grants and funding revenue, brand related revenue, and music rights based um, revenue. So these, these, some, some of these um, slides get quite scary because the numbers just look really large. Uh, but I will try my best to kind of start getting into what those mean. So you'll see the slide that's in front of you is just an overview of what earnings were from music, from South African-based music um, earners. And just to get you a sense of this is what, what those findings are, you'll see. Sorry, I'm also just trying to get to my slide. I'm blind as a bat, so excuse me. Um, You'll see that in just some of the findings, live performance is still seen as the sort of primary way that, or, or yeah, the most, the primary way that uh, um, creators are earning, are earning, um, followed by services, which refers to how, what other services as a music creator you're offering outside of performing. So are you, edu are you a music educator in the same space, etc. Uh, followed by music rights, which speaks a lot to the space that Jotam is in and the Samros of the world, etc. around royalties. And then interestingly, grants and funding, um, which is something that had predominantly been quite dormant, so to speak, for, um, for artists, for, for, for creators. And I think just the, the dauntingness of creating funding applications and seeing where funds exist. And I also think during COVID, the peak of all of a sudden there being some access to funds um, for, 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 um, for music creators. And then also just brand-related income which starts to speak, I think Shekana might be able to speak a little bit more to that, you know, starts to see how you as a brand, you as an artist with, your, with what you have and, and share in your craft start to monetize on that. So you'll see there, uh, this slide kind of gives you a sense of what those average monthly incomes were for, um, for musicians. Um, I've actually got, like I said, I'm really blind, but I just so everyone knows we have a, a ZAR and a USD-based um, version of this research just so that we, be, we try and make it a little bit more international as, as a resource. But you will see again, as, as I mentioned, artists, um, creators are making more income specifically from, from their live performances. And what this, the details of what that is, it's not just being on stage, but then the kind of deals you're making around ticket sales, um, the kind of deals you're making with venues or promoters around um, what percentage of um, the drinks you're getting, etc., as well as busking, which was quite interesting, but a very small um, percentage of what those earnings are. So in totality, you'll see the kind of numbers then that you'll see in terms of what what the general income generated from our sample in terms of value of what those amounts are. Um, services revenue, which is quite an interesting slide uh, because it starts to give, you know, from our respondents, these were sort of in order of what, how else people are making money as, as creators. This is a really nice list, I think, that starts to give ideas to practitioners and, and to creators about 
outside of my performing, what else am I doing? So these, um, in, in broad, these, we came down to a list of about 19, and this includes equipment rental, band managers, um, salaried um, uh, earnings, as well as things such as teaching fees, music, music transcription. So the scope becomes a little wider within kind of performance, but still then like now you kind of start to find other things that you're able to offer as, as a creator. Um, there was, you know, p interestingly things like what's on the bottom of that list is translation of lyrics in other languages, etc. And these, a lot of this then starts to become a little bit more, start to, started to become a little bit more interesting within the context of COVID, where then you were not able to get up and go somewhere, but, you know, you, you kind of had to find other ways. Um, then we'll move quickly to grants and funding, which, like I said, um, was not something that was necessarily a big thing within the, the creator space, but in, in that we came up with about six sort of categories or possible streams. Um, top of mind there, interestingly, was around government's grants and relief programs, which could have been affected by the fact that, yes, there was sort of the government PESPs, etc. cetera. Um, and then NFTs, which is something I can tell you very little to nothing about because it's a concept I'm still trying to figure out and really comprehend myself. But I think, again, the popularity of what was happening within the context of the environment we're in. Um, academic grants, um, NGO grants, similar to what Concert to Say does and even to a certain degree what the Music in Africa Foundation does where we start offering grants to practitioners, uh, patronage, as well as crowdfunding, which was, again, quite interesting because, again, in that time, there was a need to, there is and still continues to be a need to, to expand. Um, I think these are all still relevant now and become more relevant as we're going, um, you know, not just necessarily in the remits or, or restrictions of, of COVID times. Um, then I'm going to move to the fourth, I think, which is the brand-related revenue. Um, this, like I said, speaks a lot to product, to you and your craft and what you have to offer as, um, as, as, as something that becomes an earner for you. So these include things like acting or TV appearances for, me, for, for practitioners, how you place value on brands and then kind of expand through advertising, merchandising, which continues to be a big thing. It's been interesting watching what these international artists like your Beyonce's are doing to kind of, you know, with this tour and how much, how much income comes from... Um, a merchandising perspective. And then podcasts as well, which I think become really interesting and start to move outside of just information sharing, but content, uh, specifically content sharing as well. Um, then we start to speak a little bit to the music rights space, which I think um, Siskwen um, rightfully spoke about in terms of understanding the content that's offered by what music rights are and how you start to earn from those. Um, so in this sense, we had listed quite a number. We had 10 revenue streams that were listed uh, based on um, royalty distribution models. Mm -hmm. So these monthly incomes, again, in sort of ascending order, or was it descending order? Um, so commissions were quite important. Royalty specific from organizations such as Samro, the Capasos of the world, etc. cetera. Um, physical product sales, and you'll see, as I think we spoke Streaming services sit very much at the bottom of that list. Um, then, you know, like I said, we, we did this through a, we, we went through all nine provinces and this starts to kind of give you a sense of um, which, you know, based on your geography, where are you based and how does that then affect what your earning opportunities are? I think the, the, the general very quick response has been what these numbers have shown around um, what happens in KZN, as you can see, as per um, my little slide with the map. And I think a lot of that speaks to the type, you know, the, 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 the kind of popularity of genres within a space that starts to kind of affect how those numbers are. Um, and what, you know, one would automatically imagine, hey, how everyone comes to the big bad city, everyone comes to Gauteng to try and, 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 and break into their careers um, and make money, but it's really been quite, sorry, I'm gonna try to go back there. It's quite interesting to see how, geo, by, by virtue of your geography, what this piece of research has said, um, those breakdowns have been. So you'll see, then we kind of looked at, um, the work areas and really tried to narrow it down to just outside of urban spaces, like I mentioned. So you will see 
that still urban areas, predominantly sort of metropolis, are still kind of where people are making the most amount of money. And, and just, I think, by, by sort of virtue of logic and thinking about what geography looks like and the kind of ac access um, creators have, then you, you start to see how, these, how, how that's consumption and how these work areas um, affect earning. Um, let me just see where I am. So you can see this slide kind of starts to give you a really nice summary of in the urban spaces, you know, how, um, what percentage or, or how much value is placed on live performances, et cetera. So you start to see again, without changing that, um, that list as much as possible, live performances still sits at, at sort of the primary way, no you know, regardless of whether you're in a little torpy in Roblesdal or you're sitting in Cape Town in Camp Bay. Um, so those, you know, that still kind of has, you still see that live performance still is a bigger earner. Brand related kind of moves up on the list, which makes it quite interesting. Grants and funding, third, uh, music rights, and then of course services and offering of services is at the bottom of that list. Then the roles, um, then we kind of looked into what role you're playing and how that affects what your, how, what your revenue is and where artists are, uh, who's making uh, or who's able to generate most income based on what role you play in the, in the value chain. Um, solo artists um, naturally would, you know, seem to have been the, the higher earners with those sort of estimated amounts of what a gig is kind of earning over as an average, um, followed by bands and groups, you know, who are supporting in that sense. And then composers and arrangers and songwriters were third on the list and producers were also on the list. And then interestingly, this choirs and orchestras ensemble is really quite interesting because I think it's something that we place very little or little... <laughs> We don't consider that much, but I think it, it, it very much is something that really has become a way for creators to expand and generate income. So people are joining military bands, I think, like we discussed in Cape Town, Andre, and that kind of thing. So there's also there's just that expansion in terms of what role you're playing um, in the... And also then the, the importance of diversifying your role and how that's, that's to affect, that starts to... Um, how you need to then... Yeah, have additional skills, so to speak, or, or add odd value and see how that then helps to, to, to expand your income and your revenue. So you'll see that solo artists continue to generate the highest level uh, live performance revenue. Um, and then for brand-related revenue, composers, arrangers, songwriters made the most amount of money by, uh, per month, followed by bands and groups, again, because you're just sort of you know, outside of your individualness, you are kind of, your, your scope becomes bigger and your sense of, of access to, to, to different brands, different groups, et cetera, becomes, becomes a bigger earner for you. Then the interesting case of genre, which speaks a little bit to that slide I spoke about what happens in KwaZulu-Natal. Um, so genres, were, we had to also, you know, this conversation of genre becomes tricky, so we had to kind of figure out how we categorize um, various genres and really kind of do a general response to them. And you'll see um, the average monthly earnings reported around specific genres, so the, the genres that are technically earning more. Um, top of the list is ethno-traditional music. I think that's because of the kind of sample that we had as well and the kind of geographical base that we had, followed by religious music, which you know, I think is something that somewhat we know, and I'm not going to get into those yeah. details. Um, classical music, again, not a big surprise as such because of the consistency of such. Um, jazz was number four on the list, and what we would have imagined would probably have been sitting on top of the list as urban and pop music sits at the bottom of the list. But again, I think it's interesting. It's based on the, very, the variable dynamics of the specific sample that we worked on. So this also gives you then a sense of what those earnings by genre were and what those numbers in terms of real time money in my pocket, um, monthly averages started to look like. Like I said, I'm going to skim through this as much as possible. But I think it's also important to speak about key marketing channels because that's the point, you know, without doing a little bit of that supporting work for what you do, you're not going to be able to expand and, and diversify your revenue. So I think obviously, if I can say that, um, social media is top of the list of how the creators are really, what the creators are starting to utilize and how it's kind of bringing 
income. Um, radio set second on the list. Um, television was quite far down the list, I think, because of the cost of what that takes, as well as advertising and print media, which has become less and less popular or less and less used. And then SEOs as well were right at the bottom of that list. Then I'm just going to, there's quite a lot of detail around the marketing, which please do go to this and have a look at it. Um, and then also, interestingly, then it's kind of was also important to get a perspective of what are creators loyal to? What are, what are creators kind of seen as like, this kind of will guarantee me some kind of revenue? And um, the scores were sort of, look, these, these scores are representative out of 10. And, perf and perform, live music performance, again, sits at the top of list as kind of, I can guarantee that if I have a gig, I'm likely to earn some money. Brand related as well, because then you have product to sell and you have something that's tangible that can be usable. Um, services, again, sits at number three, grants and funding. The difficulty of writing and creating proposals and securing funding, I think, speaks to how it becomes the bottom of the list. But bottom, bottom of the list is music rights. I think, again, a lot around understanding how those, how royalties work and that kind of um, that kind of detail. So again, uh, still reiterating the need for ca a lot of capacity building within that element. Um, then we also it was important for us to speak to people and understand then where do they feel the need for support. Um, and you will see, top of this list was kind of understanding was grants and, and grants and donations, sort of understanding how that works. That's where people think they could be potential to earn more, but would like to learn more about how, how that works. Um, access to markets, which is important and a very good potential large um, um, revenue generator as well. The people, of course, as generally with other um, Workshops and other projects that we run in general training is seen as quite important and, and pivotal and then being subsidized by, by government and also then now importantly people really having an interest in wanting to learn more about the digital space and the tools that are available to them. And then I'm going to just share with you finally just a top 10 learning priority. So what areas are people really... Um, you know, if we're having workshops of this nature or any other nature, what are people really wanting to get into the nitty gritties about? So you'll see there the listed again, life performances, academic grants. I think this is also based on the kind of listing of what was available within our funding in, and those limitations there. Crowdfunding, crowdfunding ticket fees, um, the, 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 the drinks, um, splits, um, patronage, broadcast loyal, royalties, NFTs, and then how to monetize on... Um, online platforms. So yes, so that's really the gist of, of, of what our findings were. I think for us, it's always important to not just be, you know, having these sessions, sitting with data analysts and kind of going through stuff that doesn't make sense to, F2, to, to, to people that really need it. So and post this exercise, two things happened. One, we then got some experts to really look into every single one of these um, listed and suggested um, revenue streams and really give details around how do they work, how do you then start to monetize them. And these exist on our website for free to, any, uh, to anybody that wants to have access and have a look at them. Uh, we are working and trying to see how we further give um, legs to, this, to these resources and these very, very necessary tools. We're trying to work on something with the Amp Studio, for example, as Sabro as well, to really kind of get the, mus get the information to the people that really need it. I think just the third element, which is equally important, speaking a little bit to your world, Akona, um, you know, we, we also had an element and really important part of this project was to look at how we start to, based on the findings, how does this then affect policy and obviously understanding how policy then affects how much easier and how, how much simplified and more realistically then we can generate, we can expand on revenue streams. So we worked with a group of uh, policy experts as well who helped us to start to plot down possibilities of areas that we then start to present to the powers that be and see how they then start to, to make it easier for us to, 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 for creators to start to be able to expand on, on their potential revenues. So I'm going to stop there. And sorry, I'm running out of breath as well. But yeah, that's, that's, yeah, that's what I have to have. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, Violet. Thanks, thanks for that uh, presentation. Um, it raises a lot of questions, though. Um, it, it, it almost comes across, in, if, if you do just averages, uh, as if musicians are in a healthier place than they were before. And I find that interesting, um, but I'll, I'll give you my opinions later, <laughs> or we'll discuss, <laughs> um, as they say. So, Nosis, let's start with you. This report clearly um, identifies and it tries to measure a phenomena that is not usually measured. Mm -hmm. But apart from sort of data, statistics, what's your reality? What catches you the most from this report? How does it reflect your day-to-day -day, um, experience as someone who's an arts manager, as someone who's a recorded musician, who's a music creator as the jargon that's used mm -hmm. in the report? Well, two things. Um, from an Amped Studios perspective, and I think a lot of the components in this study kind of speak to that as well. Um, you know, we're working with predominantly developing artists, so people that are really coming to the space first time, and then you've got your kind of mid-level band scene artists. Uh, there's a lot of people that we maybe would be familiar with um, that are active in the space, so people that are actively performing um, and earning revenue pretty much exclusively from live performances, um, and it's very genre-specific. Um, so your, and it's interesting that your urban pop comes um, right at the bottom, but at the same time, it's also based on where our location, right? We are Joburg in a city, uh, so urban pop becomes uh, the predominant genre that everybody is coming in to try and, and, and record. Um, also, maybe I should start with like a little, little bit of context as to like what M Studios is. Uh, so we are a content creation hub. Uh, we provide free studio space uh, um, and content creation space to young creatives. Um, so essentially you can come in, book space, and you can record your music. Uh, it's got in-house engineers, we've got instruments, um, you can do live performances, and actually during COVID, a lot of the concerts that say uh, recipients were using M Studios to do um, their live streaming because we, pretty, we pretty much do it for free. Um, so there was a lot of learning there also in terms of how musicians were really trying to diversify um, the role, their roles. Um, so not only looking at just, um, you know, live performances and the live streaming aspect, but also, you know, how, does, how do I take what I do and, and my network of artists and maybe start a podcast um, and interview all my friends um, and, and kind of work it out that way. So I think um, just, yeah, in relation to the report, from that perspective, I would say it is pretty accurate, um, but also at the same time as an artist um, who also falls into a sub-sub-genre that is not popular at all in terms of will not be played on radio uh, predominantly, um, partially maybe by Kaya, um, but if not by Kaya, nobody. Um, but we rely, and you know, we found a very interesting um, method of earning income where it's predominantly live performance and grant applications, right? Um, so during COVID, uh, we actually released an album called On Your Own Clock, uh, which was a collaboration between South African artists, UK artists, um, and artists in Senegal. And we were funded by the British Council. Okay. Um, and so it's really about us then going out and looking for those opportunities um, and saying how do we still maintain our presence and still get to create the music that we feel we want to create, um, but also finding other ways to earn income. So I have a day job. My day job is operations manager at M Studios, right? Um, so I've had to also look at finding ways to diversify myself um, as, a, as an artist and as an arts practitioner to say how do I still maintain doing the music that I love to do, um, but also being able to pay my rent. Um, and you'll find that a lot of people have got that kind of dual reality where they've got day jobs, um, but you know, it's, it allows them to stick to the essence of what they want to do. Whereas if you, we then also have the, like a lot of people that want to get into the urban um, genres, um, and that becomes a little bit more tricky because it's so saturated, right? Um, so for you to break into that is, um, requires a, a brand new strategy. But yeah. 
Okay. Mm. Uh, this raises a few things again. Mm. <laughs> um, first of all, there's a pattern here. You were talking about U a U.S. Um, sponsor. Mm. You were talking about the British Council. Mm. We're here about the Norwegian, Norwegian. Yeah. Right? So let's just think about this. Mm. Mm. Uh, I don't think this is healthy. But, yeah. Mm. Okay. And then the next thing is... The report, you talked about the numbers being really high, right? And you're breaking them down, uh, Violet. And now, Nosis is telling me she's got a day job, right? And I'm thinking, yes, the report somewhat represents this very specific group, but it's not necessarily representative of South Africa, because in terms of the report itself, it might say from the numbers I've counted, 2,881 to the 141 plus number, you know, that figure comes to 47,000 rands a month mm. that musicians are in, on average making. And I'm not sure if this is the reality. Let's think about this yeah. too before I throw yeah. out the questions, yeah. right? Can um, I just quickly say something to Please that? do. So like, there's something that I noted here and I thought it was really important to note as well is that uh, you know, when we were looking at the genre, um, the genre breakdown, right. which I think is really important in that um, if you're looking at your urban pop uh, genres, there's also a predominance of piracy that happens within those areas. So you find that there's a lot of earnings from live performance, um, but less from your music rights um, yes. components because they, people are not actually buying music Music. And the loyalty of the audience there is also very split because of the amount, like the, just the sheer number of people in urban pop. Um, whereas if you're looking at your uh, traditional uh, music and your religious music, it's fanatic based. Um, even Afrikaans, I would say, mm -hmm. also very fanatic based. So a person who I may not know of is a millionaire. And we experience that. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of reality TV shows that are coming out now where you find a lot of the Maskandi artists who are showing their lifestyles and you're like, wow. This guy is coining it, you know, but you don't, you've never heard of him in your life, right? So it, it just shows you also that there's a, there's, a, there's a different type of music audience as well and how they interact with their musicians, which, is, um, which I think would speak to the levels of success of different artists. Yeah, please, I Violet. I agree mm -hmm. quite a bit with Nosisi, but there's also, I think, quite a really poignant phrase that, that active music creator. Um, so this is someone also that is really pretty much doing this as a predominant nine to five. You know what right. I mean? As something. So every you know, if you're not in studio on Monday, you're you are recording someone else. You're teaching at a school on a Friday. You're doing you're fixing violins on a Wednesday, etc. So that that active consistency, I think, also then just starts to 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 um, to play a role. I think that's something that's like really worth considering as well. Right, right, right. So, so you're saying this study is definitely not representative of... I think also the, the size of the sample, if we're being, you know, just, you know, because within the restrictions of what we could do, our sample is, was a limited sample and we tried to diversify that sample as much as we could. 3,000 respondents to research is it's not huge. Right. Um, if you look at what the numbers and realities of what the industry, how many people are active in the industry, you know, 3,000. But I think it's important to start to show something. I think it's important to start to share data and start to share, just to start to share what the options are and then people explore those and then, you know, hopefully when we go find funding from somewhere, <laughs> don't know where, um, we're then able to kind of start expand that. And I think for us just to be quite, um, uh, quite a key thing for us, when we did this research, it was to create a model and sort of use a pilot to see how can we actually realistically try and start gathering this data. We, and by testing it out and trying out, out here, how do we then take that, that, how does that become a replicable model? So how can we take this research and do this in, in Kenya? How do we do this in Mali? How do we do this in Morocco? So okay. just to create a model that then becomes replicable and then starts to become not just representative of the context of South Africa, but the rest of the continent. Okay, because, so, yeah, it's just, um, for instance, we're talking about genre, right? Um, my mom and I, last year, we went to the Eastern Cape. Um, we, in Queenstown, I think it was, I bought, was standing at a petrol station, and somebody said they're selling music. They're a gospel musician, mm. right? So they sell me a USB, right? 
And I'm thinking, I've never seen this before. I pay this guy 100 rands. I don't like gospel music, but my uncle loves gospel music. So we're on our way to see my uncle, and I bought him this thing, and he loved it, right? It's just, it's so interesting that, you know, the kinds of ways that musicians try to survive in rural areas. Because Queenstown, as much as it's a big town, it's a very small place to make music, to live as a musician, right? So now this brings me to you, Shekinah, right? This report talks about how um, in Durban, for instance, let's say KZN, right? Uh, this was really stunning to me, that KZN, um, yes, you did say it's, it's probably genre-specific. I'm thinking about Gom, I'm thinking about, uh, what's this? Amaskandi, uh, right? Um, I'm thinking about, but, but specifically, I think it talks that the report mentions urban uh, sort of popular music. Right? It doesn't actually say traditional music in relation to KZN specifically. Right? So that's a high number. So I'm thinking specifically um, whatever genres that are sort of the subdivision of GOM, house music and all of that, and what you do. How do you think it speaks to your experience as a musician of, please tell us your genre? <laughs> I think it's um, pop, R&B, um, it sometimes falls under urban. I think it depends on which composers I'm working with. Uh, yeah. Okay. And in, in relation to, because you're from KZN. I am. Right? So in relation to KZN, what happens in KZN that you think generates so much money? <laughs> I, I don't, I think in my personal opinion, um, I think the people in KZN are very protective about their space. Um, and that goes for anything. Uh, we are very proudly KZN, and I think how it works there is not necessarily how it works anywhere else. You kind of have to belong to the ecosystem that's yeah. um, from KZN, and I'm not necessarily f in that ecosystem, so I don't benefit from it. I think if you were to open up um, my stream streaming reports, you would find KZN to be the least streamed place for my music. Um, it's probably the least place I perform at as well. Um, I think I perform more in Cape Town and Johannesburg. Um, but I think that's just belonging to the space, belonging to the ecosystems, f you know, contributing to that. Um, it's, it makes it difficult for anyone outside, um, but I think it's just their way of protecting and keeping the people in KZN alive. We buy from KZN people. We, you know, we, we only take counsel from KZN people. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, yeah, that's how it is in KZN, and I, I, I appreciate it as much as I wish I could get in. Um, I'm somewhat adjacent to it, mm -hmm. so I do get some benefits of it um, and some love from KZN, but I just think they're a very knit tight-knit community. And I would say the same for Pretoria, but um, I guess it's not showing up in the research yet, which I think is amazing, first of all. Um, as artists, we're so out of the loop because we're stuck in such a creative realm. We need people like you in our space. We need to coexist with people that are doing um, data analysis because we can learn more about this stuff. But I think the more people invest as well in giving you data, um, the different numbers will change and maybe you'll see the same thing in Pretoria because I find that with Elaine or a Reese or um, Focalistic, um, mm. I find a very strong community in Pretoria as well. Right, yeah. right, right. Except, you know, if we're thinking about live music venues, um, where do these people perform in Pretoria? Where do these people perform in, in, in KZN, generally, yeah. right? Um, okay, um, so Violet, for me, um, your study has shown how many directions um, revenue generation has expanded towards, mm -hmm. right? But would you say that it shows, or at least it portrays, a pre-COVID picture? That's interesting. I think 
I think maybe the perspective is that this is, these are the options, right? And I think that's kind of what the focus should be, that these, you know, whatever the environment is and whatever the circumstance around an environment allows, these are the options and let's see how we start to interrogate those and utilize those and exploit them. So I think it prob there probably is, you know, I'm, I'm no researcher, but there's probably, there's definitely probably some shifts and some, some effects of what COVID did and what they kind of spruced up to a certain degree. But I think that for me, the key thing is that these are what the options are and let's explore and exploit these options at any given time under, under whatever circumstances. Okay. Yes. So when you're talking about live performance venues, for instance, I think it's very difficult, different for, let's say, uh, people in your, your particular yep. industry, so your pop, your pop, your urban pop, as opposed to your jazz uh, live band um, type venues, where what, what, what we found actually is funny because I was, I was watching an interview that we did in 2019 when we released an album called Spaza, mm -hmm. and um, Ariel Zamonski, who's a bassist, was saying how there are no venues, and that was 2019, yeah. right? So he's like, yeah, we're struggling with venues, you know, and there's no live performance spaces, and, you know, we come out of COVID, um, and we're still in the same place, if not worse for bands, I think for bands specifically, um, to a point where... You know, now we're having to kind of look at reappropriating like places that were like coffee shops or restaurants and saying, hey, um, can we come and do a live performance? Your space is great and we'll bring in sound or whatever, which means then that also that the whole ecosystem around like everybody's struggling, right? The sound guy is struggling, the guys who rent out the PA um, and the backline are all struggling. So they're all coming up with very um, creative ways to interact with each other, I think more than before, whereas if I was a, if I had a band, for instance, like I do a series of shows at, at Breeze Block and, and, and other venues now, just recently, and that just kind of came from me feeling like I just miss seeing live music, right? Yeah. And, you know, there's this, like, weird venue in Melville on 6th. It's called 6th, and it's, like, on 7th, and it's just loud, and I'm like, oh, this is not where we're supposed to live, you know? Um, and so it's like, okay, how do, we, how do I then go to places and, and try to negotiate something? But what I found is in that interaction is that um, the stakeholders are more willing to play with each other now because we all find ourselves in the same boat than we were previously. So in, instead of me like having to hire sound to say this sound is like a fixed fee, there's 5,000 and 5,000, that's it. Now I can negotiate with the sound guy and say, hey, um, can I give you, it's all based on a percentage of doors. So everybody that's interacting with this event that's, is saying we'll take a percentage. Um, so it's, it's less, then it, it, it gives you, there's less risk. You know what I mean? And a lot of people are a lot more flexible. Whereas, I don't know, maybe for you, Shikana, it's, it's something completely different in, in terms of like how you guys interact in the urban pop area, because from what I see online, it seems like you're very active also, yeah, and, stay, and there's more stages for you. I think um, there's definitely a difference between pre and post COVID. Um, and that's definitely a big thing where we are forced to collaborate with each other, which is beautiful. Mm. We should have been doing it in the first place. Mm. So there might not necessarily be venues that we know about, but like unassuming places are taking on sound, this, this, and making it a space where you can come and enjoy and listen. Well, even if it's an office park, you know, you can find something weird happening there. Um, but for me, I think in a post-COVID world with my type of music, whether it's just like festival, big festival kind of shows, there's been a lot, a lot more, which is just weird. Um, I think last December was the busiest December I've had, but I think that that there is a demand on my end of the spectrum. I, you know, I can only speak from mm. my side, mm. but however, I do work with live instruments, so I do struggle to book my my team, I do try and let them know two months in advance because my drama also plays for Loiso or Cuesta and his dad's church. And sure. uh, yeah, he has to diversify. Has to yeah. diversify. Mm -hmm. um, so with the live musicians, I understand that they earn less, they're more busy, um, and yeah, they have to diversify. So I guess I found it a lot difficult to keep the same people on stage with me all the time just because people are 
you know, in survival mode still mm. um, and taking as much as they can. Uh, so I guess I'm somewhat in a, a more fortunate place. However, it does also depend on the relevancy of your music, um, where you get to be and what stages um, you get to be on. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. In fact, um, I'm going to have to you know, ask, get your questions. But just quickly before I say that, there are two points you've raised. I think we need more research on explaining, not just providing data about, you know, labeling things, identifying things, which is fantastic, but data that also explains why things happen the way they do. There isn't enough of that in South Africa. Um, um, can I please have a show of hands on how many questions we have? Okay, one, two, three. Okay, let's 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 start with 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 this over here. Just one other thing you said, basically what you two were agreeing on is the fact that your genres are different, and have different requirements. Um, I hope somebody raises that because I, I I'd like to follow up on the fact that acoustic musicians, for instance, have have it difficult to people who work on the electronic and um, digital space. But that's something else. Um, there was a, yes, thank you. Your question. Am I audible? Beautiful. Hi, uh, my name is Roderick. So uh, my question is uh, towards Shekina. Mm. So um, I log on to my Instagram all the time and then I see uh, the brands promoting you. Actually there is a campaign right now, uh, an Adidas campaign. So I actually wanted to know like, how do these brands approach you? Do you approach them or? Do they come to you and what value do they get when they work with you and collaborate with you? Sure. Um, I approach a lot of brands. I'm sure a lot of brands are running from me wherever they are. Um, I'm always trying to hustle people to get money. Um, uh, but most of the time, you know, it's about branding and I'm fortunate enough to kind of have that relationship with them. But it's all based on interaction and like how you work with the people in the team, whether you can propose something long term. Um, I think the beauty is is that everyone is trying to make something happen, um, and you are also at liberty to suggest, create, um, offer something, uh, which is why we see such beautiful collaborations like your Rich Munisi and Adidas or your Tebe and Adidas. These things have come together to like, you know, not by one partner, but both parties have come together to make that. So yeah, I think it's also good to pitch to brands as well. A lot of stuff that I have uh, is through pitching. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for that question. Um, I would like to, to highlight Shekinah is particularly exceptional, right, to the average musician. Okay, so I'm, I, let's not make this a standard. Let's think about ways of, of introducing nuance, complexity to this discussion, right? To what she was saying, yes. Just in terms of branding, yes, please. Is that, um, you know, from what, from what I've seen, we've had a, a numerous amount of panel discussions and different types of peop, um, musicians at different levels coming in. And I think in relation to brand, relationships with artists, it's always around value, right? So um, a lot of artists kind of, um, no matter what level they're in, don't actually understand, you know, when you say Shikana's in a particular space is that she has built her brand, you know, she has created herself as a valuable entity, right? And so then she has a lot to offer. She's not just offering herself, she's offering her social media audience, so she's offering actual people that she interacts with and has an influence over. If she says, guys, I'm using this lipstick, they're gonna be like, oh, interesting, she kinda's using this lipstick, right? Because she's developed that relationship with her audience. Um, and I think it's really important for um, artists really generally to understand what your value is, so it's not necessarily around your numbers. So if you, let's say, you can even have 2,000 people on your Instagram, but have a very successful career in terms of interacting with brands, right? Mm -hmm. It's just about how, how, how you relate to your audience and whether your audience actually listens to you, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. she can have 
a million people on her Instagram, but nobody listens to her. Her interactions are like five, you know, five interactions. No one is liking her posts. No one is like responding or sharing, etc. And I can have t I can have two thousand people, and a thousand five hundred of my followers are responding to me and interacting with me, and I can probably get more money than she will get. You know what I mean? So I think there's a very big misconception around brand relationships and how that works. Um, and when people look at it on face value, um, you know, they kind of think, well, I need to get to this particular level in order for me to exactly. achieve something. And it's like, no, it's really about maintaining an authentic voice, maintaining real relationships with your audience, and just being a real person. Yeah. Um, I think that's really important to note. Yeah, so it's not just about yeah. the numbers no, yeah. at no, no, all. No, no, not at all. Uh, sorry, there was a question there. Uh, let's start with the lady, sorry. Let's start with you, sorry. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Neil Summers, I'm a singer-songwriter. Um, I'm sorry, my question flew out of my brain. Ah. Uh, the moment you guys are like bringing up a lot of other things. But oh, mainly I wanted to ask because um, I'm terrible with no, names. No, CC Shekinah Violet. Oh, hi Miss Violet. I'm horrible Violet. with names, apologies. Okay, 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 yes, okay. Hi Violet. Um, as you were pitching, like as you were saying your slides, I I can't really read much. So where can I get access to like you know the information you were giving us? Because I, sure. yeah. Yes. Um, this exact research um lives on www.musicinafrica.net for slash rsfam. So it lives in its very in this exact format. It's there, and it's also like I said. Then within that same page, there's a lot of chapters, if I could call them. I think we've got about fifty something odd now. So chapters detailing all the little bits that are mentioned within the research. So musicinafrica.net is where you should go and find it, all right, thank you, thank and direct everyone to do the same. Do the same thing. Thank you so much. I have a last question. May I ask? But. Um, what, how does an upcoming artist, right, who, let's say, my following is there and it's almost 2,000, ne? but my interactions go as far as 10,000 people that do come onto my page. But most of the time when brands want to um, interact with artists, it's a matter of like, nah, you have to have 10,000 followers or you have to have 50,000 people, but 50,000 people are viewing my page. It's just that they're not following, but they're viewing it. You know what I'm saying? So how does one like Liberate. necessarily approach, approach brands like that on some, okay, I got some people. I can't hook you up. Can you hook me up? You know what I'm saying? And also, she kind of like, when you approach these brands, how do you, I mean, you're approaching them, so how do you say, okay, nah, I can work with you, but I'm going to need like 50K. You know, like how, like how do you put a, a price on that, yeah. basically, on, based on what you got, yeah. Is it me? Yes. Um, <laughs> you, you need to hang around nerds, music nerds, and um, just open your circle a bit so that you can sit with people and conceptualize and let the, the people that like, are not as artistic or whatever just formulate all that stuff beautifully like this. Simple as a DM. Hi. I'm so and so. Can I please find the right channel for the marketing or whoever? and I have something I would like to send, speak, whatever, and try that way. It's also about networking, being in the right space, trying to figure out, you know, where, where the right marketing agencies have their after-work drink. I know it all sounds very, like, shallow and stressful, but if you open my Instagram today, um, you will see DMs to Cartier, DMs to Momentum, DMs to, you know, and through that I, just, I realized that Discovery actually has systems in where you can send these things and say, this is what I'm applying for. They have sports, music, projects, whatever. Um, I think that would fall under the category of grants. I think grants and funding, yeah. So, but I would have not known that if I didn't DM Discovery myself. Um, you just have to put yourself out there, which I hate doing, um, but you, you kind of just do. So just to close that up, um, you actually don't do all the work yourself. 
You no. work with a team no. that does this. So for the average musician who actually works on their own, that means something completely different, right? Okay, one last question before we close. We have to close, unfortunately. Good afternoon, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ayanda, well known as Three Heads. I'm a DJ, producer, and vocalist. Um, I'm a con con currently subcontractor and a manager of KCBR uh, as an actor. Um, I'm basically teaching him how to swear, uh, DJ and do a lot of things. So my question is basically right now overall is for all the ladies in front, um, we are struggling at the moment, yes, with getting gigs because my artist is mainly an actor. Now he's went to being a DJ. So now we're getting all these gigs, um, uh, and now he's struggling to get a clientele. It's another different country, different world on its own, uh, where from, from, apart from acting. So now we're taking this route, and we're starting to get events, um, like Lesotho. We're starting to get events in uh, Botswana. But now we, we're getting called mostly out of the country, more than inside, with this reputation that we have. So... Where do we look to or where do we go with this kind of rep uh, representative? Um, where who, do, who do we talk to to actually get uh, our popularity going uh, and growing here in SA? Okay, thank you very much for your question. Uh, I'll direct that to you, Narcissa, no, because she should answer that too, but I'll also answer on my pers okay. from my if perspective. If we can just be brief. Very brief. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so... I can speak from self-experience and as an artist and as an artist manager. Okay. Um, you have to create your own opportunities. Um, a lot of artists that, have, that made it needed to build an audience. So in order for you to build an audience, you actually need to go and approach venues and work on your own events first. No one is going to believe that you can bring in an audience unless you, you show them that you can bring in an audience, right? Um, so... Um, I'll, I'll, I'll make an example. There was an artist that I managed. She was really, really massive in her day, and she kind of went through a bit of a career slump and felt that... And so book, bookers, promoters were not booking her. Um, and so we decided, let's do a 10-year anniversary of your career, and we filled up a 8,000 packs ve venue. Um, from there, it li literally catapulted her career because then promoters are like, oh, damn, you're so relevant, right? They forget about you because you must understand South Africa has got so many artists, right? So, you know, you have, to, you have to keep reminding people who you are if you are already established. And if you're not established, then you need to start building yourself up and, and building your audience. Okay. Thank you so much, guys. Um, I hope that answers your question because uh, it's just... Your report has brought up a lot. It's become kind of like an advice session for others instead of us listening to your research and engaging with it. Um, but I mean, I, I find it interesting that your, your report particularly also suggests regularity uh, or consistency in the availability of work, you know, um, I'd love to talk to you about that, maybe off the, off, off the, the, the platform. Um, but thank you very much for your questions. Thank you for listening to this conversation. And I hope, I really hope we have more um, institutions, organizations like yourself, Concerts SA, yourself, Music in Africa Foundation, that actually care about, I don't want to call it a sector. Some people don't like it being an industry or a sector. You know, we have practitioners, we have a diversity of experience and why they do what they do. For instance, the choirs you mentioned, they completely behave differently to a solo artist and they exist for different reasons to what solo artists do, right? Uh, and I'm glad we have Carla Mombelli in the audience. <laughs> right? Because, I mean, I've, I've read what he said about making music and it makes sense to people of a particular generation, but of a generation now, you know? Um, and so there's a lot of people to learn from in this room. Thank you so much, Andre, for inviting us. Okay, great, we're done. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you. You know, you often go to these music industry panels and it's all men on the panel. 
It's so nice to see you guys up here. And, you know, um, Janus is you too. So the, the, it's funny, you know, JR wasn't on the panel, but you were saying they need to make the circle bigger. And you said, show them. So you need to show them. And it's all about being relevant and making yourself relevant through your social media and stuff. That was really cool. Violet, thank you for the presentation. And I know it's a start. It's a template. And we'll work on it together in future as we build the research capacity of a sector. That's what we need to do. Um, we may be looking at a follow-up. Um, and, and, and if you ladies are nice to James, and, and then we might do it with you guys, but we'll see about that. Um, so, and s somebody said something about struggling to find gigs. If you're struggling to find gigs and you need platforms, then you need to stay for the next session. Because the next session, um, I see Nikki's here, Nikki Sondlos from Nikki's, who's been going since 1990, what Nikki? 1995. She'd been showing them since 1995. And she's running a successful venue since then. I'm not sure if Sol Shibamba arrived, he's not here yet, stuck in traffic. So we're going to shift the session slightly. Um, over there in the lovely coat is Mr. James French. He's the man that makes a lot of this stuff happen. So he'll be on the panel with Nikki. And then Steve Quenham or Quenna, is Steve still around? Yep, Steve's over there hiding behind the pillar with me behind the pillar. Those are the people that run the venues, run the platform, has been doing many things. So the suggestion is grab a quick cup of coffee. First come, first serve. I'm not sure if the donuts are still there. Grab your coffee. If you need to smoke, uh, I'm not going to talk to anyone in particular on my left. If you need to smoke briefly outside, have a quick smoke. Grab your coffee. You can come sit in here, network in here. Ladies' toilets, first one right. Men's toilets down the passage right. See you back here in, let's say, six and a half minutes. Okay.
Susan? Uh, I see on the screen we've still got a dude playing guitar. Is that on the stream? Okay, cool. Um, ladies and gentlemen, and Nandi over there, and everyone by the coffee station, we're about to start, and we're starting a very important session with the guys that own and run venues. Um, so this section is called Keeping Venues and Music Events Alive. How will music venues and music events survive post-COVID? And it's a panel discussion which they call it key industry players. I like to call them Andre's friends. Firstly, we have Nikki Sondlo. Mum Nikki has been keeping Nikki's alive for a long time. It's a platform that has supported thousands of artists. And uh, the one time we were having a discussion at Concerts SA about our funding was, look, our funding's coming to an end. But when they were cutting our funding totally, we had a meeting at uh, the Subs' coffee shop. And Seoul, by the way, Seoul is stuck in traffic. You know, coming from Pretoria across the Burovos curtain is very difficult. So he, there was an accident and he's stuck, so he might come and join us. So Seoul was going to sit where James is sitting. Uh, James, that's James, and that's not Seoul, by the way. So Seoul was going to sit there, but James has decided he's going to sit there and he's going to speak about the venue. So we were at Subs' coffee shop and Sol and Sibusile said, Andre, if the funding is cut, we new kids on the block. Give the funding to Nikki. We need Nikki's to survive. And Nikki's have survived. Oh, yeah. Then we have Steve Quena Mokwena, intellectual philosopher and also known as the, the captain of the African Freedom Station and has been running it for a long time. It's a venue that uh, has done a lot for many and it's a very interesting cultural space. And uh, Steve has kept it alive, even when it closed his doors. And we hear, Steve, it may be up and running very, very soon. So soon to be launched, the African Freedom Station. Now, with Concerts SA, we've supported over a 1,000 venues. And we're supporting the last iteration of venues. And I come up with a lot of ideas, but someone's got to do the job. And that's James French. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. James French. He's representing Saul Shibambu, so he'll talk as if he's Saul as well, so forgive the accent, yeah? Okay, I'm joking, James. <laughs> okay, let me sit down over here. So, James, you asked some interesting questions the last time that I'm going to... And, and, and there was an opening kind of a thing. Concerts SA started with the dream of creating sustainable circuits around the country. Steve, I heard you talking about that earlier. We've learned a lot, and we've learned that sustaining, sustaining a venue is hard work. It requires a level of multitasking, coordination, from food to security to facilities, often in under-resourced context. Thank you for the hard work you've done and your generosity for supporting musicians and live music. You guys have kept the flame alive. And we're here today to try and figure out how the hell did you manage to keep that flame alive? So, Nikki, let, can we start with you, if that's okay? Can how did you manage to keep the flame alive for so long? Mm, I was is a roller coaster ride. Uh, some years are good, and um, others not so good. But the passion. Um, and um, a whole lot of things that come with it, the musicians that you feel you've got to be there for. You know, they make it easy for you to carry on. We've been through so many challenges. Uh, COVID was the worst because nobody was ready for it. Uh, the whole country came to a standstill. We were all kept at home. We could not move. Musicians could not perform. So our livelihood was um, no longer there. And somebody had to, you know, 
to, to, to get things going. Somebody had to motivate others, and uh, somebody had to talk to people and let them know that, you know, when this all ends, at the time we thought that it was going to be, you know, after, I think it was, we were told 20 days at first, uh, if I'm correct, and uh, it went on for a long time. When, and I remember when I got that call from Andre in, it was around September, August, September in 2020, to say, are you guys ready to come back and do what you are good at? We were overjoyed, was very excited that um, we are going to be back and we are going to, you know, keep people, give them hope. It's not only musicians, it's sound engineers, the whole, um, our staff members, their family, musicians' families. So if they don't perform, then it means that there is no food on the table. The car guards that are there that um, will say, Mamniki, if you don't have shows, we also, you know, our, our families do not eat. They also, you know, you're doing it for, for everyone, for all of us, and also for ourselves. The joy that we derive from listening to the music, um, it's a whole lot of things. And um, yes. <coughs> I mean, what people know of that you kept the venue alive, mm. but others don't know that during COVID, you and I were working on food parcels. <laughs> mm. <laughs> There's so much that we had to do, you know, to yeah. put smiles on, this, on, on people's faces. And, and uh, sometimes you would get people together and say, we've been hungry for entertainment and I know that when we did that some of the musicians would come and 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 perform for us when we we're not supposed to be performing by the way <laughs> you didn't hear that part <laughs> um, Steve your space was a beautiful space not just a music space but an art space and I, I believe you've sacrificed a lot to keep that flame burning for so long. How did you manage to do that? The, the, the African Freedom Station, I often say to people that if we had tried to write a business plan and say this is what we're going to do and we'll succeed and there'll be a, a great musical renaissance, they said, no, 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 you're talking crazy because you don't have the money to do it. We, were, we had a space which was less than 40 square meters. We had a little passage and a thing at the back. We had one toilet. Sometimes we had 100 people. It was a, I remember a, a great a, a man who runs a, a great concert looked at me and says, this thing is not supposed to work, but it's working. And I realized that the only thing that thing worked was the generosity of musicians and other artists that followed them, the photographers, the poets, everybody. And it taught me a lot of things about what Jakana was talking about, the ecosystem. Uh, we were all an ecosystem. We created a creative economy. When I say the people who made clothes rocked up, the people who took pictures rocked up, even the people who sold cannabis rocked up. And so you, you just had a whole bunch of people who depended on each other. And what drove it was that the great musicians who were not known then, you know, the people trying to make music, were generous themselves. If anybody who can say they were ever paid like handsomely at the station, they would be really lying. Because most of the time we're just trying to create joy, trying to create life, trying to make ends meet. And I remember the when Concert South Africa came in, it made things easier. Then there was a time when there was, it wasn't going to happen again. And when we were called to a meeting, we were there with our Sisniki. Sisniki answered the question very simply. said, well, we're very thankful for the support. But you know, we are used to paying musicians from our kitty. So when you're thinking about venues, there's a new venue now, exciting venue. I'm very excited about it, which is in Melville, the, the, the pizza joint. It's like the cost is great, the space is secure, the thing is beautiful. 
But what will really drive this pace is the generosity of musicians and the people that love them. That's the only way that this thing kind of really works. The research shocked me that the way musicians make life is through live music. So if you don't have venues, if you don't have platforms, you don't have, they, they, they're not going to eat, and we're not going to be able to have what to So this thing about how do we create venues that can sustain themselves out of a long time is a very important thing. James, you deal a lot with the facts, figures, and data that the venues need to give to you. But you also talk about generosity that Steve just spoke about, passion and drive. With all those venues that you work with, what, what do you think helps them to keep the lights on and keep the candle burning? Well, let me just first say is that I'm, I'm always in awe of anyone who runs a music venue because the amount of work involved is not just simply saying hi to guests and making sure that they're comfortable and letting a band play. They have to do everything from register with Samro, Sampra, Capasso. They have to make sure that their license for liquor is around. They have to make sure that um, the neighbors aren't complaining about the noise. They need to make sure that the, um, the, the, the artists themselves are able to get enough money at the door to make a living from the space. It's, it's a huge amount of responsibility. So when I talked about generosity, it's not generosity necessarily of handing out money. It's generosity in time and patience. And every single musician that I've watched in someone like Nikki or Steve working with has been a personal friendship and a personal relationship and made sure that the musicians at least have a meal in their stomach by the time they've ended the gig and that they're walking home with a bit of money to help pay for their children's school fees. It's no joke. It's a massive responsibility and I think that rarely the venue owners I've worked with are all incredible people who have done a great deal to support their communities. When it comes to statistics, this is actually backed up because if you look at just the last run of our music industry, um, our venue support, we, ran, we supported venues from, um, I think it was March to June. And we had about 40 concerts, which we subsidized. But in those 40 concerts, we created over 800 job opportunities. And it's, that's just the immediate job opportunities. That's the musicians, the sound engineers, the, the backing crew, it didn't include waiters, Uber drivers. It didn't include the, um, the, the people who make sure that, the, uh, um, that there is a generator on the space because they have to deal with load shedding. And so when you start experiencing that as a, an actual, um, as a music venue owner, you start realizing that you are balancing and you're juggling millions of balls in the air and trying to keep them in the air while monitoring a, a very fragile ecosystem. Yeah, and James, you didn't even count Nikki's car guards, huh? Mm -mm. Yeah, so <laughs> that ecosystem's much broader. Coming back to you, Steve, um, you've done this, closed the door, took the keys, and setting up shop again. Yes, it's brah, you've got a lot of tenacity. From your experience, what do you think would make life a little bit easier for a venue owner or a promoter? Okay. I think that Freedom Station was a particular thing, the first one, and we learned a lot of things. And, I, I, and, and the, the second one, what's going to make things easier is having a better system of working. I was t talking earlier to say, you know, Concert SA was one of the most forgiving systems to work with. I used to have my receipts, and some of them I say, I come, I say, hey, and you realize that if you don't have a supportive donor, supportive whatever, this thing is not going to work. But the other thing is that I think that the sector that we started with has grown. Every single one of those musicians, whether it's Malcolm or it's Ntutuzo or it's when Bakuli Lebonke, these people, they have an inherent worth. Now, the audience around them also has a worth. So how do we create the thing that uh, if this matters to you, you will pay? and you'll pay in advance. You see, at the station, people would come in and sit, they'd play three songs, and then I'd say, okay, we'd pass them around our kitty, and other people would look there, whatever, whatever, and we'd never, but now I think there are systems that we need to like graduate to the next level. The other bit that we've done is, I would like to really, uh, if the station is so dearly loved, I'd like to make it into a membership organization. For the price of a cappuccino a month, you can be a member, 
you can come work with other people. You could get access to our Zen garden, our coffee shop, our jazz room, and our because we've grown 40 square meters to 560 square meters. So this thing itself has become a success in that way. We will be, and uh, rather than saying we'll book you, I would like to give a challenge that curate yourself. If you have, if you can bring 25 people that you can that could that are prepaid, then we've got a show. Then we've got a show. So we've never really pushed our artists to that level. Because they just force us, you can have a gig, and we say, okay, this is a one, and then we put up the thing, and they know at minimum they'll get the concert South Africa thing. But if you say, eh, but we can't have a show unless we at least have 25 people, then it's everybody's game, I think, you know? So I think we have to move our systems and our culture to the next level. But I also know, man, just Nikki will tell you, People can be sneaky. They will come to your venue and try to sneak themselves in, and they'll go to the plush venue and they'll pay. So we also have to be much more business-like about this. Thankfully, I'm not a good businessman. So I, we have to employ people who can do that business. And in any case, I've, I figured if I'm going to have a freedom station as, as a thing I do, I'm going to have to get a day job. Because it cannot afford me it cannot afford to pay for my children's school fees. So we have to find another way that if it doesn't have to feed me, then it can feed itself as well. So there are many ways of trying to, to so cut the thing. It sounds like yours is looking at your business model it's and how to shape that, not just the external context. Yeah. Coming to you, Nikki, um, how do you deal with the sneaky people that want to sneak you in? <laughs> and then, like, uh, what, what, what do you think should be able to happen to make your business model easier? And while you're thinking about that, because it's quite a tough question, I would like to welcome Mr. Saul Shibambu, who braved the traffic to join us. So, welcome. And please come join us on stage now that you've arrived, if that's okay. But I won't ask you a question straight away. Okay. <laughs> that's Saul Shibambu. No, it's fine. We'll, I think we'll continue the way. Let me sit there, and then you can sit there. Or actually, they're going to mic you up so long, Saul. So. Okay, cool. Nikki, so um, what can make your life easier and dealing with the sneaky um, buggers? I just mentioned one thing that is very important for venues audience. We need those numbers because um, one, it's the, we want to create, you know, a good vibe for one. When you have um, a band, that is performing on stage, and you have a few people um, in the audience, then it, it, it becomes, everybody becomes miserable. We become miserable because we've made this to happen, and nobody's going, getting anything back from it in return. Um, Concerts SA, with the funding that uh, the Norwegians um, has uh, given to concerts as a to you know as a, as a support system has uh, been a cushion um, because it's been very difficult for us to to rely on door takings. And most of the time, you've had to take money from the till to pay musicians. And much as you feel not so good that you're not going to be able to pay your staff members, you worry that when the musicians leave, what are they gonna take home? So it, um, it has really helped, um, but then again, uh, we have got to be, we try to be firm, and you, we have those sneaky people <laughs> who will say, we will bring you more than 25 people. And then they come, it's easier for them to just say, please, here are my banking details, give us the money that Kansas SA, uh, you know, gave us. So it's their money. It's not 
they don't have to do anything to make sure that there are people who are sitting on those chairs, listening to them, and uh, it becomes a problem for us. Um, we've tried, we try to encourage people in so many ways. We help with advertising, we help um, with getting them paid because the band lives with a check when they get, when, you know, when they go home. But um, yeah, it's, one, it's been one of the challenges that um, have been there for a long time. And maybe the musicians who are here can tell us how best we can all do it to make sure that we all benefit from this exercise because um, venues close down uh, because of not getting support, not only from the musicians. Sometimes, I know that everybody tries, but um, we need people to sit on those uh, chairs to support. So, so Nikki, what I've heard from you now, and we're gonna get to that, how many artists are there in the audience again? Nikki put a challenge to all of you. What can you do to make the life of a venue owner a little bit more easier? But we won't ask you immediately. Think about it for a little bit. Let's come to James. Solo, you mic'd up? Come have a seat, Drew. Okay, James, you, you can approach this probably from a research perspective and all the venues that you're working with and their reports. Okay, let me sit there. Sol wants his chair. Okay, James. What can be done? Live music faces quite a quandary at the moment. Um, at the moment, how many of you are streaming with Apple Music or Spotify? How much are you paying? Maybe a hundred rand a month, right? How much is that? How much do you pay for your water bill in a month? Certainly not a hundred rand. You're paying less for a constant stream of music than you are paying for your water bill. And yet that music takes time to produce, it takes time to perform. And the part why I'm going this way is that music is being devalued on a, a regular basis. The value of music in the perception of the consumer is being devalued so that when you buy a single online, you think that, you know, 10 rand, 15 rand is okay. Whereas the, the amount of work that went into producing that song. Now, when you go to a live concert, we have the same problem. Live music venues, there's just an assumption that why should you pay for the live musician? You're going there to be a, a patron of the venue. So I've seen more and more, particularly since COVID, free gigs, where the musicians aren't being paid by the audience, but they're being paid by sponsors or they're being paid by the venue. And to me, this is a dangerous place to be because the audience are the ones that are actually consuming your music. They're the ones who are enjoying it. And surely they should learn and make it a learning that they should be paying for the, 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 the enjoyment of what you're providing them as technically what is a service. So there is one solution there is to start encouraging audiences to understand the value of music. Of course, there's going to take a t time. I mean, if I had to say to you, you're actually going to have to pay 250 rand for a ticket to go to a gig, you're going to balk and say, that's a lot of money for me and my, my partner, and I'm not going to pay 500 bucks just to go and see the show before I pay for food. But we have to at least get the culture of spending money on music to grow in South Africa. Beyond that, when it comes to the actual venues themselves, there's an excellent piece of research that came out in 2016 called It Starts With A Heartbeat. And uh, Andre knows what this is because he was part and parcel of writing it, as was Gwen. And this was a concerts essay document to tell cities on how to create an economy for music venues. Extremely valuable because the, the cities themselves aren't supporting venues. In many ways, they're to the detriment of the venues. I remember, do you guys remember the Orbit? They were raided by the police because no particular reason. That kind of ruffled some policemen's feathers and they, got a, they, they shut down the building for the night and shut them down on the basis that their, their light to their stairway on the emergency exit wasn't working. Very petty reason. That's not enabling live music culture. It's quite the opposite. Um, there are numerous examples of this where uh, owners of venues have been treated like criminals by the people who should actually be trying to support the industries. And I'm also looking at you, the CMOs. You need to understand that your venues are the people who are going to pay your license fees if they're reasonable. So 
we need to develop that night economy. We need to develop an economy that helps live music and all the arts. It's just not just music. Think about transport. I have worked with musicians who cannot perform in Johannesburg because they're based in Midrand, just because they cannot afford the Uber fee home. And that is, they can't be guaranteed the ticket. They have to beg from the, how many times have you guys been asked for Uber fees? Just so that they can, the taxis will stop running, there are no buses. All of these things. And so it's, what can we do for the venues? We can lobby government and tell them to start waking up and realizing that this is a very important place to be. Thanks, James. And that's, that's government again. but. So I'm going to come to you, but before I haven't get your your musicians, you're not off the hook. You still need to answer that question. I'm not sure who represents all of you here. No, no, we're going to get to you. Don't worry, so first. So think about what you can do to make the life of a promoter and a venue owner just a little bit easier. Sol Shibambu, he does concerts in small villages there in Bronco Spreit, and then not just at one school. He brings a whole lot of school kids together. And I go there and I see the lights go off. And Violet and I talk about our joy drug. So Sol is the purveyor of the joy drug, which is letting these school kids experience real music. Sol also does gigs at a venue called Nikos in Sokolumi village. Ne? And as I walk out of that, that gig, there's a woman busy prying the chicken feet and the giblets across the road. Very tasty. And there's a little installation of a tractor, which is what I thought it was, because it looks so old and decrepit. Meanwhile, this guy rocked up to the gig with a tractor in his clothes and everything. <laughs> Very interesting space. So, so how do you keep on doing what you do? And what could be done to make it easier for you to keep on doing what you do? Uh, first of all, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it starts with a passion, I believe. It starts with a passion of wanting to see people get something from watching a show, something from hearing a particular song. And with, with, with the schools, it's just amazing how school kids in the rural area, farm areas, light up when they see an actual guitar or the drum kit, because these things, they see them on TV or see them on books, and they never get to experience them. So when we go there, it's, it's just amazing. You know, sometimes you drop a tear here and there because you see how they appreciate what they see in real life. Because some thought it was something like, Sp like Spider-Man or, um, one of those, you know. So when they see it in real life, it, it makes a huge difference and it inspires them. Um, I think we started this thing about 10 years ago and um, when the school programs were still heavy and happening on a regular, um, there was a 14-year-old who took the mic and she sang so beautifully like an angel. And right now, I'm happy to say that she's busy recording her first album. And it's so beautiful. <laughs> and yeah, I would like to thank uh, Concert SA, the Norwegian Embassy, for you know, coming up with these programs so that we can inspire and educate, you know. Um, we had a lot of incidents, uh, you know, there was accidents uh, here and there with uh, schools and uh, Concert SA was there to, you know, pay condolences to the families that lost children in the school bus accident. Um, but yeah, we had the good and the bad and the ugly and the lovely. <laughs> uh, when it comes to Live music. Um, I usually go to spaces where there's no live music and I would go there and say, please give me your dead day and they'll give me that day and I will make sure that on that day there's always an audience and how do I do it? I don't know, I just talk. You know, I speak to people, I tell them there's something interesting happening at that venue on this particular day, uh, come in and let's see. So we'll do 
two or three gigs for free, and then from there we introduce pay as you like, and after pay as you like, then we have a fee. And um, over the years, we've managed to to keep Nico's Sports Bar alive. Now they can have gigs without Concert SA, and uh, which is a very good thing. Um, we have Bentley's Country Lodge now, and um, uh, White Corner, it's, it's in Harangua and Pretoria North. Um, last week we just had the great Louis Mlanga performing there. It was packed and uh, thanks to Concert SA. Um, tonight we are having another event. It's also a Concert SA event and already, um, you know, when I left Pretoria, it, it was packed. The parking was full. There's something interesting that we do to get people in. We say, we say pay what you like, and whatever they pay there on stage, it goes to the artist, and he, they, they, they see what they do with it, with the band. We got to um, a space where the venue pays for the, for the band that's playing there, the, music, the, the audience themselves get to contribute whatever they have to appreciate what they, we don't have a, um, um, a door taking, but everyone must pay what they like with a minimum of 50 rands. So people actually appreciate and they show up and they really give, um, and then what we have from Concert SA, it also a boost for the musicians for the band. Um, I'll keep on doing this um, as long as I'm around uh, because it's first the love as a musician myself. And uh, secondly, a lot of people who come to the gigs that we do, they, they've got interesting stories to tell after the show. You know, when somebody comes to you and tells you, three weeks ago I came with my wife and they had a, uh, my wife had a stroke, she didn't even want to come here because her mouth was somehow, you know, she covered herself there. And two weeks later, they come and tell you that, you know, what happened here two weeks ago? My wife came here as a person who had stroke and she left here a person who's healed, you know? So there's, there's a lot that music does and we should keep on doing. We don't know people's problems, but they come to gigs and their problems are gone. So um, we must make sure that the live music and the live venues stay alive with or without um, the fans and all that. We must try and conscientize our audience to contribute. It might not be entrance fee, but when you are sitting there and you hear something nice, you hear something you love, you hear something that speaks to you, you know, take out that 50 rands, take out that 20 rands, put it down there on stage. And now it happens so you don't even tell people they hear something they like, they stand up. And when the other sees the other standing up, you know, they just go there. We don't even have a, a head or anything there, you know. So let's, let's always inspire. Let's go out there as musicians, as promoters, as um, ordinary music lovers. Go there, listen to a song or two. Just have that 50 rands in your pocket to say, I'm going to put it there. And you don't know by putting it there how many other people will follow suit. Just inspire, you know. Take it and make it your, your every day that I'm gonna attend the show just to contribute my 50 rands and this 50 rands will bring other 50 rands from the audience, you know, so yeah. Thanks, so, so as you guys can hear, Saul is not just the, the purveyor of the joy drug at schools, he uh, does a lot of other things, including purveying healing. And I think um, it's important that th there's other aspects to music that's 
but I won't go into the depths of that. So we're going to hand over to the musicians, but while I hand over to the musicians to tell us what they can do, there's two other venue owners in the audience, and Nikki, I know you don't really want to speak, but would you say something? And not yet, not yet. And you, Carlo, you're also a venue owner. So now for the turn of the musicians. What can you guys do? The gentleman in front. Uh, microphone, I believe. Uh, greetings, everybody. Thanks for hosting today, guys. Uh, good to come and just share some ideas with people and get some advice. My name's Jeremy Franklin. I'm with the All Stars Band. Um, just to speak about, as we're saying, trying to get feet into venues, essentially, you know. Um, that's going to create a vibe in venues, and it's going to pay fees. So, obviously, we've got to lobby government. Um, if we can get funding, half the problem's been solved, you know. And I think if that funding's coming through, it's going to create a robust... Uh, kind of environment for all of the musicians and also for our communities. Like if you look at the States, um, Hollywood, the music industry is huge. Massive, massive revenue turned over in America. Africa's a, a gold mine of, of music. You know, if we can access that, then it's, it's just going to build a momentum and uh, we're going to be flying, you know? So we're kind of sitting in this post-COVID uh, scenario where we're trying to kickstart things and we're thinking about how can we get people in there? Um, you know, the apartheid system, it uh, devalued the musical culture because it threatened, uh, threatened them because it gave people a voice. But, you know, we've got over apartheid and um, we're looking at uh, the value of music in our communities. Sorry, I've just written stuff down here. I'm reading what I wrote down. Um, so please, if you don't mind me just reading this. Everybody wants to attend events, but unfortunately many people can't. It's a stumbling block, and um, this is what you're talking about. How do we get the people in if they can't afford to go to the shows, you know? Um, so the funding's important, and uh, I think what Brussels saying there is important, that you're getting a kind of thing where you're saying to people, if they get in there it's before a certain time, they're paying 50 rand and they're getting access, you know? We've got to start thinking like that. Not everybody's earning 50,000 rand a month where they can go out with their family and take everyone for dinner and, and all of that, you know? So what we got to do is get those people who can't really afford to go to the events um, into the venues. And that includes a lot of musicians, you know? There's a lot of musicians that would love to go and attend events, but they just can't afford to get in there. So they stay at home and they think what's going on. The same with students, you know? Students is a big body of um, support for music, and I think a lot of students aren't attending events because they just can't afford to go in there. So I think if we could implement some kind of card system, maybe, like a VUCA card system or something, where if you qualify for that card, you get that card, and you have it, uh, you've got to renew it annually or whatever, but then you get access to venues that are registered for that card, and you're paying like a half or a quarter of the price that a normal person would. But, and so what that's going to do is it's going to be bringing in a whole lot of people that normally wouldn't be going to venues. It's just an idea. I've thought about this. You know, it's been a thought in my head for many years, but today's a good uh, time, I thought, to share it. So we're just seeding an idea here. And I just think, you know, if, if you guys would please consider that, then maybe we could get a lot of younger people in there and those people that love music, that want to be attending events, but just can't, don't have the means, you know. Thanks, Jeremy. That was a good input. That was a well thought through input. I think this lady in front would like to respond. While she's responding, Carlo, Carlo, Nikki, um, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to. So this lady in front, and then Nosisi, and then we'll, okay. One, two, three. One, two, three, four. And then we'll hand over. Carlo and Nikki, you've got some more time to think. Okay, so go for it. Can, please add, if you want to add to what he says, but introduce yourself as well. Okay, um, good afternoon everyone. My name is Yolanda Ferris Klashi. Um, I'm an artist, but I also work as an arts and culture facilitator at the organization called Africa Tikkun. Um, basically on what I'm here from what Mr. Steve was saying and Mem Niki, um, it's not an issue of people not being able to pay, but it's an issue of people coming to the event 
And uh, I would say, like, as an artist, it is very important for you to be also visible. Maybe go to the venue, check, and you look around, you, you do on socials, you also hang, you also interact. Let me I'm from Deep Sloot, and I'm supposed to perform in Soweto. And obviously, if people do not know me in Soweto, I need to be visible to go and visit and communicate and share and interact, network, engage with people. In that way, it is easy because as an artist, it is very important for us as well to play our part. And uh, by playing our part, it's also to be visible and to show because one peop maybe people from Deep Street might see me in so it will like we want to go to the venue. Now already I have some clientele that wants to follow me. So I think the visibility of an artist is very important as well. Thank you. Uh, good day. Uh, I go by the name of Tabiso Komako. I, I come from a play, uh, I come from a, I, 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 I come from Soweto. Uh, I'd like to ask a question uh, about like uh, getting performances and gigs how can we get uh, performances as DJs on like uh, concerts and live performances thank you for that question although this session was not for you to ask was more for you to give so we want the next one two three to consider what you give because they get a lot of questions so Nosisi the lady in the pants and then um, one at the back we, we, we in, sorry, that's a nice pants. Okay, so <laughs> no, CC first. Okay, um, one, two, three. We'll go to the two venues in the audience, and then we'll end off with you, Rosie. Cool. Um, again, thank you so much. Um, I am a live music enthusiast. I love going to live music shows, um, and I think that the question actually is to, should be twofold. I think the relationship is between the artist, but also with the venues. Um, I think venues themselves also have a responsibility to create an experience. So something that I've always kind of thought about is, um, if, I go to, if I know that Africa Freedom Station, like for instance, Africa Freedom Station, when it, when it was around, I never knew who the artists were. Let's look at a Malcolm Gianni. No one knew who Malcolm Gianni was. But you were guaranteed that if you go to Africa Freedom Station on a Friday night, guaranteed you're going to find something incredible happening there, right? So that takes away from, from I think, the artist's responsibility and more around the venue itself and how it wants to position itself in the market. We can't all be the same. It's not a hall with sound. It has to have an identity. It has to have an ethos. It has to have a, 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 a personality. Africa Freedom Station had a personality, right? And I also very much am interested in that idea of a patronage and a membership fee, right? Because what we're actually doing is that we're believing in something. I don't care which artist is there. I know that Brastiv's taste is the taste, right? So I know that every time I go to Nikki's or I go to, Brass to Africa Freedom Station, I'm guaranteed that I'm going to have an incredible experience, right? And I'm going to learn something. Because we're also living in a space where not everything is accessible to us, right? So we actually have to go to spaces to learn about new artists. Um, if the sister there is from, uh, she's in a band from Dipsluit, and I live in Kensington, how am I going to know about that band? Do you know what I mean? Other than if they're going to come to um, Africa Freedom Station, you vet them as a venue and say, yes, you meet our criteria. Um, and then you are servicing your patrons, you're not necessarily servicing, yes, artists, yes, yeah. Hi, everyone. It's now Summer X again. I ask a lot of questions, I'm sorry. But, uh, <laughs> um, so your question was, as an artist, what am I giving to um, venues, right? Well, for me, it's a matter of, I know that my fan base supports me. Whatever I do, they'll be there. And I know I have people that will come through regardless of what their situation is because that's the kind of relationship I make with people. It's like a matter of like, I got you, do you got me back? You know what I'm saying? But my experience with um, a couple of venues that I've done, I did bring people, it got packed, but did I get compensated? No. 
you know, uh, um, it kind of, that those kinds of things, I don't know, it, 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 it takes away because like, I'm at that age where I'm done studying now. My parents invested so and so much, over half a million, to, for my education in like music and all of that, you know. So now, I know the value I can bring, but I feel like I, sh I show it to you, but it's not seen. So I don't know I, I, how we can like, as artists, meet each other halfway in terms of that, you know. But I like the idea of having like a, a loyalty card thing. And I feel like it would be cool to also have like a point system in a sense of like, um, you get a card that says 10, that has 10 parts. And then when you get to number five, for every event you've come through, you get 50% off. And then when you get to number 10, you get in for free. Now people are more motivated to come to each and every single show. You know what I'm saying? And also something that artists can bring is saying, okay, um, here's my guest list. Here's everyone that I'm coming with. I know so and so and so and so and so is going to be supporting when it comes to alcohol or food or whatever, whatever. But okay, how can we meet each other halfway? Because I'm also being coming from Joburg Central, driving all the way here. The cost of the car and everything, everything is on my end. But, you know, how do we, how do we meet each other halfway? I'm sorry for putting a question in top of oh, my no suggestion, but yeah. <laughs> meet me, let's go 50-50. Yeah. Okay, so the lady at the back, briefly, please. Um, um, I think we were supposed to have closed a bit, but please go for it. Yeah. Thank you. Hello, Alani Kiza. I'm a singer-songwriter. So I'm just uh, want to say what we can give as musicians, but based on experience from my producer, who's also a musician, Mark Beeling. So what he does with venues is, he says to them, right, you do your marketing, I'll do my marketing, we piggyback on each other, we sell tickets, the tickets go towards uh, the funding of whether you've got a roadie who's carrying your, your gear, uh, funding obviously towards the musician, and anybody else like the engineer or whoever else. But also with that, the marketing, not just the word of mouth. I'm Mark Beeling, I'm now doing X, Y, Z. You are the venue, you're doing X, Y, Z. But here we go. A month in advance, this is the marketing I'm doing, this is the marketing you're doing. I don't think that venues need to be um, put under the, the X. I think venues and musicians need to work together because both need to make money. Bringing people in from um, an area where they're not going to be spending money is very difficult <laughs> because you're not going to be able to make money. So I think a point system is great, but making sure that the people that come to the venue are the people that are going to spend. Yeah. But both need to work together. Cool. Okay, to Rosie first, I think, and then the two venue owners in the audience, and then back, we're going to hand the last question back to you guys to sum up. Rosie. Uh, thank you, and good day. My name is Rosie. Um, you know, I, I think that... As a culture in South Africa, the, the problem is that a lot of people don't want to experience new music. They kind of only feel, you know, if you've got a Louis Maklangu at your venue, people will pay to come in. Um, but if you've got a band or an artist that no one's heard before, people are very reluctant to pay. And I think it goes back to what we were speaking about on radio a bit earlier, that if an artist is not well-known on radio, if they're not promoted, if they don't have a hit song, they don't have a big album, people don't want to pay to go and hear them. And I think we don't have... You know, in many countries overseas, people go to a venue because they know they're going to hear a new artist. Not because they want to hear someone whose music they've been listening to for 20 years or 10 years. And I think that it's also, along with positioning, you know, a lot of venues, they, they get known as a restaurant or a bar or a whatever. And then there happens to be a band playing, so you must pay for it. So... I think it goes quite deep into even working with media, with radio, and getting radio to promote venues as well as a specific artist, and for venues to try and instill a culture into people that you don't have to go to a big festival and hear 10 bands on stage 
to have a good time or hear some emerging artists. And I think there's really a culture in South Africa that people don't want to experience new music. And I hope that somehow some change will be made. Thank you. Thanks, Rose. So, uh, Carlo, Mickey, and then back to the panel, and we're going to round up. I'm going to ask you a question before we round up, though. So, Carlo. And I'd also like you to reflect on some of the inputs as you round up. Thank you so much, Andre. I think ours is very simple. So I'm Kalo Gutle from Quanto Village. It's a, a venue that I've built up in KZN. Uh, well, KwaZulu, not, not Natal. Uh, so we're more in Midlands, we're not in Devon. Uh, so I've just built by, you know, inspired by, by Steve. And we have a different proposition is to inspire the artist. That's, 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 that's where we sit. We want to make the artist so happy that he will come to Kwandu. He will come to Kwandu and offer his experience because people consume the artist. They are the ones who carry the magic. So that's, that's our offering. We sell an experience, but we put the, the artist so much at the top. We offer them good food. We give them the best venue and we treat them so well that in their plans, they will always want to come to Kwantu. And to us, it's not about the performance, it's about them showcasing whatever they do. So we don't really sell the performance, we, we sell, you know, those special moments, you know, when the artist takes a, a trumpet and walk around the venue and blow. You know, for, for us, that's the that's important part. If there's an event and there are people there then they get to experience, then it's a tick for us uh, from from the money perspective you know then <laughs> then then Andre we, we we talk to Andre but on my side I'm an IT specialist I love music so I just throw all my money into that thing and also I think we must encourage people to do things like that you know to if they love the art they must support the art mm -hmm. you know it's it, it talks to that uh, otherwise you know it's it's about critical success more than commercial success on our, on our part. Thank you, Carlo Kuhla. Um, lastly, we're going to end up with Nikki, but that was quite interesting. Your place also provides magic. Yeah. So, Nikki, um, you, and then we'll hand to, your, to the other Nikki and the rest of the panel. <laughs> well, Andre, as you know, I don't necessarily want to speak, but, and we are a venue, a new venue, who didn't really want to be a venue, but we are one, and we are enjoying it thoroughly. Um, so I can only really contribute a few things that we've had since we've had the sponsorship from Concerts SA and a bit before. Um, initially, we just gave our space free to artists and um, we charged a door fee and then that door fee went to the artist entirely and we obviously would give them something to eat and so on. Um, what's happened with Concerts SA is that it really has allowed us to formalize ourselves we think about it a lot more seriously now. Um, we've sorted our branding out. Um, and the way that we've gone about with these shows is that um, we've sent a, a request for information to the artists. Um, and in that request for information, they provided us with their handles, all their social media handles. Um, and we listed it on Quicket, and as the Quicket sales came in, we've informed them every day as to how many tickets were sold so that they could be in the picture. And um, for two or three of the shows, we had sold over 50 tickets prior. We have our wonderful Tyson Gumbo at the gate. You don't put your foot in until you've swiped your card <laughs> to make sure that people don't just come in and disappear. And I think um, because of that, we've, we've really been able to be very fair with the artists. In fact, you know, perhaps even to our own detriment. Um, and I agree that for us, the first most important thing is for the artists to be, you know, happy and to enjoy the space. And, um, you know, hopefully things can grow from there. Thank you. Nicole. Okay, so now... We, we're running over time, but we... Sorry, Violet? What is the name of your venue? Do you want it pronounced? 
Chiesa de Pazzo Lupi. Lupi yeah. I just want to say a one other Which thing. Which means what? It means the Church of the Crazy Wolves. Okay, so, <laughs> so last week we were in a touch of madness, and now you can go to the Church of the Crazy Wolves. I want to say one <laughs> thing, uh, and that is that we don't favor any particular artist. Um, we have thought about it for a long time, yeah, we but do. we are open to any idea, and we think that every artist potentially has a following. And if uh, we can work uh, with them to bring their following to us, we are happy to have them there. Okay. One, there's one last guy that's burning to tell us how we can make money, I think. <laughs> that's what he said. He said you want to tell us how to make money. Okay, uh, Sofiso. Hello, everyone. Sorry, I'm not pushing a pyramid scheme. Okay. Um, <laughs> I thought since you were talking about venues, so um, we own a venue here in Bramfontein called Untitled Basement and Artivist. Um, I thought I'd come join this conversation because it's always really pretty to just see all the other sort of cogs in the wheel. So as I've been listening, I think the one thing I've picked up is that um, there's a silent war between the venue owner and the artist, which I think is sort of like an ongoing sort of tension. And I think the two need each other extremely much right now. Um, we've also had to become sort of teachers to the artists on how to run an event so they can actually begin to produce their own events outside of the venue. Mm -hmm. We also have had to learn to conscientize the artists of the cost of producing an event itself. So beyond them being a performer, it's there's the what does it actually cost us to put this thing together so that by the time the money comes in, you fully understand where it went right or where it didn't go well. And I think after COVID, we also realized that um, promoters can't afford to use a space. So we've now learned to do sort of partnership deals, all sort of upfront payments, but structures that can accommodate an artist. Um, I think also the, there are opportunities for an artist to start understanding what does my, my brand, or which brand does my, as an artist, which brand does it align with? So it's always good because what that does is sometimes you get a sponsorship from another brand we can leverage to help you make the event experience really, really great. Um, I think in other countries, there are some systems where an artist is able to be part of a membership scheme or part of something where when they go to venues, they don't pay. We as venues are then able to recoup. If an artist and you present your card, I belong to this sort of association, artists are then able to come into a venue for free. And what that has been important in those countries is that a lot of artists can't actually afford to attend events because they don't actually make enough money. But those schemes and systems allow an artist to support, show up, but at the same time, it also helps venues to generate revenue. And I think lastly, between venue and artist, artists need to begin to understand that outside of the venue, you should be able to be building your own brand so that when you put something out, we can help you also fill up a room because at the end of the day, it is business, and when we win, you win. When we lose, you lose. Thanks, uh, Mr. Kabash. It sounds like I've been handed a research project for Concerts SA from some of you. Um, we're now going to close with our panel, the wisdom of the panel. And uh, as you reflect on these comments and the advice given to you, which Nikki asked for, by the way, I'd also like you to reflect on the raison d'etre for Concerts SA. We started this project to try and build circuits, to try and build music circuits. And now we figure out we live in a PC world, a pre-COVID world and a post-COVID world. So in this PC world, is it still the mission that we should be building circuits? Is it possible? Please tell me if that's possible or if I'm smoking in my socks. And then have a reflection on the advice that was given from the audience. Who would like to start? James. Um, to be honest, I don't think that we can continue without developing these circuits. They're vitally important. The, the generosity and the collaboration between artists and venues also needs to exist between artists and venues across different parts of the country. 
I don't know if you are all aware of the original vision of Concerts SA, which was to actually create a constant circuit for artists to be able to travel from Johannesburg down all the way through the garden route to Cape Town and then come up the M1 on the other side. How long would that take? Maybe two, three weeks? That would be about a gig every second night at least. That's good, sustainable work, really good promotion. And if you've got a good series of artists, you could have a constant circuit of live music, a constant circuit of new music coming to different venues and people communicating with that music in new ways. But it requires a, a capacity for the venues to communicate with one another, the artists to communicate with one another, and to actually to practice a form of best practice in which they know that the network or the circuit cannot survive if I'm going to shortchange my artists or if the artists are going to misbehave on stage because it, it disrupts the whole flow of things. So in the end, it comes down to everybody, and I know it sounds a bit like my private Idaho, working together in harmony. So, you know, it's, uh, it's possible, it's doable to continue. Um, we need to make sure that um, the artist is always on stage. And how do we do that without funding? How do we do that without uh, any other form of support? <clears throat> the venue needs to assist the artist to, to come in, bring their own people, and have constant performances there. I've got a, a project called Switch Your Music. It's been going on for three years now, three years before COVID and two years after COVID. Um, it's where we bring young artists, switch your music, meaning switch your IQ, tune into something new, tune into something fresh, tune into something that you've never heard before. So we balancing the old and the new, but in this project, we're strictly going for something that's never heard on radio, something that's never seen anywhere. If we vetted you and you, you, you speak to us, we put you on stage and we go out there, look for funding and make sure that we have a gig. Um, Another thing that we, we invested in over the years, it's, it's making sure that we've got sound stage and lighting. So it's easy for us to put up an event anywhere, even though that it's costly, but we, that's why we, we go into our pockets to make sure that working with the artist, they, they, they bring the numbers, we bring the numbers. It's, it's a collaboration. So let's keep on doing that. And not, let us not be dependent on um, saying that we will get funding here. We'll, no, let's do things. Let's stand up and do things ourselves because I've, 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 I've created more gigs for myself than I was booked by a promoter. Then I saw the importance of just making sure that wherever you are, when you see a venue go out there, speak to the owner, and create something. You know, I still need to, to come and play at uh, Mom's Nikki's place, cause, but now we've, we've been too busy to, to go and, you know, do that. But we believe that um, keeping the live music active at all times will help the artist will help the venue to stay on and be relevant. Yeah. Thanks, so. Seeing you mentioned Nikki, maybe you next, Nikki. <laughs> <laughs> Closing comments mm. or circuits? Yeah, it's, it's encouraging to hear people, um, musicians, like the young lady in colorful pants, you know, when she says, um, my fans will always follow me, you need to make, you know, noise out there. You need to 
be known. You encourage your people to follow you. Um, last, was it last weekend, we had Ipu um, Gabiko. I mean, those guys, when they come to your venue, they push, they engage, they want to know. And we sit with musicians, we, you know, we help them as much as they also help the venue when they come, when they bring people. So we, we work together. It's very important that we do. Um, and with, you know, people like you, it's easy for us to say we had a wonderful gig. When would you like to come back again? So it's supposed to be a two-way, you know, game. And it works best for, for, the, for the artist and, and for everyone. Then people will be asking, you know, other artists, why do they have uh, so much exposure when we do not get a chance to, you know, to be on different platforms. Because with the many um, venues that we have, we have many shows. And all these venues need musicians. So the ones who market themselves, the man, the, you know, who, who are known out there, are the ones who are going to be given opportunity to perform in all the venues. So it's good for musicians. And we will be there to always help as uh, venue owners to knock at the door uh, and say, Concerts SA, please, let's keep on doing what we do best. Thanks, Nikki. We'll now end off with some wisdom from the station master himself. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm a changed person. There, 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 there are three things I'd like to, 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 to experiment with from a research point of view. Uh, who, who James was saying, you know, the experience, people don't have the experience of concert. What do you, what do you get from it? Now, please remember that music has changed so much that now you've got DJs, she or he can stand or they can stand with their gadget and play for thousands of people and leave with hundreds of thousands of friends. The aesthetic of you playing the drums, somebody playing the bass, is people are not used to it. Our children don't use to that. They're used to the kind of smooth radio thing that comes from that DJ thing. So the first thing I'd like to do is to introduce the African Creative Institute, which is focused on children and young people. And we'd like to do like once a month, we have a market, and our core audience is bring the children to the music. Uh, also, I, I, I don't like the idea of try, us trying to say, you see, the music, boom, I'm a piano, and other musics, they're very big musics. You know, they're talking thousands of people. Tina, I don't know what your capacity is, 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 is Nikki. In our new venue, our jazz room will be able to take 50 people. If I talk to you and you say, I've got friends, I'm going mama, 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 I'm going to give you the Quicket app and say, show it to me a week before the, the thing to see whether your friends are coming or not. And we've got to have a threshold that says, if we don't have like this 60% of prepaid thing, we can't have your show because this thing's not going to So I'm, I'm going to try and experiment with some of those ideas. First, reach out to the children because the children will bring their, their parents and they will be a lifelong supporter of this thing. I'm glad the Untitled is in the house. Big love, brother, because when the Orbit went and the station went and Nikki's was there, Untitled came in. And it came in in a very incredible way because it was really moving spirit. And soon after that, you saw there were other venues as well. So we are not the only venues. There's new stuff, like the vernacular venue. There's all sorts of stuff. And, all, and people are becoming much cleverer and much stricter as well. I'm all for segmenting. The Freedom Station is primarily about serving artists, not just musicians painters, art, art, poets, whatever. So this is our core audience, right? And we know that these people can't afford a 300 rand ticket, right? They can afford maybe a 100 rand ticket, 150, whatever, 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 whatever. So we are quite happy to be the station where people can travel into this culture 
make it affordable and make it accessible. So we still want to stay with that, but make people take responsibility for their thing as well, you know? Because there are people who, who want to go to Nikki's. They love Nikki's, they understand. Their peers are there, their friends are there. Then there are people who won't be free at, the, at, the, at, the, at Nikki's or at the title, but at the station they can go wild, you see? So we segment, we all, we all know, that's what the second was. When we were actually pumping in Josie, we had the station, the big bands would come, and they would come and rehearse at the station, and have their preparation show, and then go play at the, at the orbit. It was no skin of our, our thing, because we understood that it's a kind of an ecosystem. So if we keep the, the ones that we've got, and we, we institute a new culture. I like that try something new, because most of the people, they stand there. The current winner of the Standard Bank Young Artist Award, Untlantla, Uskakan, Uskakan. Uskakan, he thanks me always that I was the first time I played in Johannesburg. I played there. You know that night they didn't get paid. They were called. They were, they were, we, we all cried. There was no people. There was no money. Whatever. Like we just stood there and they got into the yellow car and drove back. But for years he thanks me for that moment because it opened. So what I'm saying is that the musicians themselves, you got a much bigger job than the venue, the venue, at least for the station you do, because our program is now curate yourself. You want to show your paintings? You want to show your movie? You want to play your band? Quick it, as born. What we will guarantee, and people know that the station will give you that, is we'll give you total attention. Total attention. And that's why the musicians love to play there. Okay. Please, please remain on stage. As you can hear, ladies and gentlemen, the station basker, master and the panel has spoken. Um, uh, Nikki Sfiso Kalo, could you join us on stage? I'd like to take a picture with some of you guys um, as we close off the session. Um, many of you have heard that concert essay. Sfiso, come along. Kalo, Nikki, and any of you that would like to join some of these venues, we'll take a little bit of a picture together um, as we're setting up there. Um, you've heard that the Norwegians are no longer funding, their funding has come to an end for Concerts SA. That does not mean that Concerts SA has come to an end. What it means is that the funding for the program has come to an end. Concerts SA is still around, and the good news is that Samro has stepped in, and we have operational funding for the next two years. So, but I think, um, and I think we've got quite a bit to do. Instead of just funding the programs and the projects, we've got quite a bit of research. We've got to find ways of doing that harmony bewegen. And there's lots of things that we need to do, and we'll find ways of doing it together with Music in Africa, you know CC, and a whole range of you. You got ideas, and you got money? Come talk to me after the show. <laughs> um, then one thing I've been ending up saying and asking you to say with me, 55 million, 80% of the project funds, the public of Norway needs to know that South Africans are thankful. And how do we say, I'm going to say it one, I'm going to say it on three, and then we all say it together. We're going to say thank you to the people of Norway. One, two, three. This and that. Cool. Okay, um, uh, there's, oh, there's a gig at Nikki's tonight. Um, uh, Mark Fransman's playing. Yeah, all that the uh, Nikki's, mum Nikki's, Nikki's, other Nikki's. Have you also got a gig tonight? Oh, other Nikki's tomorrow night, and you've got? Tepo. Tepo. And have you got something on? Stogie tea today. Stogie tea today. So, you've got? What? Itumo Tubo. at the Bentley's, yeah? At Bentley's tonight. Uh, Kalo. He's in recovery. <laughs> Steve is busy building. Okay, so, okay, and we're not going to sneak in at Nikki's. The first 20 people that goes, and if you go there early, we'll be paying for the first 20 tickets. So no sneaking in. Um, anybody would like to join us for this picture over here? A picture with the venue owner so you can be at the start of us building the next music circuit together. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thanks to the people on the stream. Okay, cool. Have a seat.